The following is a conversation with Konstantin Batygin, planetary astrophysicist at Caltech, interested in, among other things, the search for the distant, the mysterious Planet Nine in the outer regions of our solar system. Quick mention of our sponsors, Squarespace, Literati, Onnit, and NI. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that our little sun is orbited by not just a few planets in the planetary region, but trillions of objects in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud that extends over three light years out. This to me is amazing, since Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our sun, is only 4.2 light years away, and all of it is mostly covered in darkness. When I get a chance to go out swimming in the ocean far from the shore, I'm sometimes overcome by the terrifying and the exciting feeling of not knowing what's there in the deep darkness. That's how I feel about the edge of our solar system. One day, I hope humans will travel there, or at the very least, AI systems that carry the flame of human consciousness. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast, and here's my conversation with Konstantin Batygin. What is Planet Nine? Planet Nine is an object that we believe lives in the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. It orbits the sun with a period of about 10,000 years and uh, is about five Earth masses. So that's a hypothesized object. That's There's right. some evidence uh, for this kind of object. There's a bunch of different explanations. Can you give like an overview of the planets in our solar system? How many are there? What do we know and not know about them? at a high level. All right, that sounds like a good plan. So look, the solar system basically is comprised of two parts, the inner and the outer solar system. The inner solar system has the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, Mercury is about 40% of the orbital separation of the, where the Earth is. It's closer to the sun. Venus is about 70%. Uh, then Mars is about 160% further away from the sun than is the earth. These planets that we, uh, one of them we occupy, right, are pretty small, okay? They're to leading order, sort of heavily overgrown asteroids, if you will. <laughs> um, okay. And this is, this becomes evident when you move out further in the solar system and encounter Jupiter, which is 316 earth masses, right, 10 times the size, um, you know, and Saturn is another huge one, it's 90 Earth masses at about 10 times uh, the separation from uh, the sun as is the Earth. And then you have Uranus and Neptune at 20 and 30, respectively. For a long time, that is where the kind of massive part of the solar system ended. But what we've learned in the last 30 years is that Beyond Neptune, there's this expansive field of icy debris, a second icy asteroid belt uh, in the solar system. A lot of people have heard of the asteroid belt, which lives be between Mars and Jupiter, right? Like that's a pretty common thing that people like to imagine and draw on lunchboxes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But beyond Neptune, there's a much more massive, and much more radially uh, expansive uh, field of debris. Pluto, by the way, it belongs to that second, you know, icy asteroid belt, which we call the Kuiper belt. It's just a big object within that population of bodies. Well, Pluto the planet. Pluto the the dwarf planet, the former planet, you know. Why is Pluto not a planet anymore? I mean, it's tiny. We used so to- size matters when it comes oh, to planets. Oh, 100%. 100%. Right. It's a, actually a fascinating story. When Pluto was discovered in 1930, the, th the reason it was discovered in the first place is because astronomers at the time were looking for a seven Earth mass planet somewhere beyond Neptune. Okay? It was hypothesized that such an object exists. When they found something, they interpreted that as a seven Earth mass planet and immediately revised its mass downward because they couldn't resolve the object with the telescope. So it looked like a just a point mass, you know, star mm -hmm. rather than a physical disk. And they said, well, maybe it's not seven, maybe it's one, right? And then sort of over the next, um, you know, I guess 40 years, 
Pluto's mass kept getting revised down, down downwards, downwards, downwards until uh, it was realized that it's like 500 times less massive than the Earth. Yeah. Right? I mean, like Pluto's surface area is almost perfectly equal to the surface area of Russia, hmm. actually. And, you know, Russia is big, but it's not a planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually, we can we can touch more on that. That's <laughs> that's another discussion. Uh, so, in, in some sense, earlier in the century, Pluto represented kind of our ignorance about the edges of the solar system, and perhaps Planet Nine is the thing that represents our ignorance about now the modern set of ignorances about the edges of our solar system. That's a good way to put it. By the way, just imagining this belt. Mm -hmm. of astro of debris at the, at the edge of our solar system is incredible yeah. um can you talk about it a little bit what is the kuiper belt and what it, what is the oort cloud yeah okay so look the simple way to think about it is that if you imagine you know neptune's orbit like a circle right kind of uh maybe a factor of one and a half 1.3 uh times bigger uh, on, a, on a radius of 1.3 1, 1. times bigger, you've got a whole collection of icy objects. Most of these objects are sort of the size of Austin, you know, maybe maybe a little bit smaller. If you then zoom out, right, and explore the orbits of the most long period Kuiper Belt object, these are the things that have the biggest orbits and take the longest time to go around the sun, then what you find is that beyond a critical orbit size, beyond a critical orbit period, which is about 4,000 years, you start to see weird structure. Like all the orbits sort of point into one direction. And all the orbits are kind of tilted in the same way, by about 20 degrees with respect to the sun. This is particularly pronounced in orbits that are not heavily affected by Neptune. So there you start to see this weird dichotomy where there are objects which are stable, okay, which, are, which Neptune does not mess with gravitationally, and unstable objects. The unstable objects are basically all over the place because they're being you know, kicked around by Neptune. The stable uh, orbits show this remarkable pattern of clustering. We, back I guess five years ago, interpreted this pattern of clustering as a gravitational one-way sign of the existence of a planet in a distant planet, right? Something that is shepherding and confining these orbits together. Of course, right, you have to have some skepticism when you're when you're talking about uh, these things, you have to ask the question of, okay, how statistically significant is this clustering? And there, there are many authors that have indeed called that into question. We have done our own analyses. And basically, just like with all statistics where, you know, there's kind of like, you know, multiple ways to uh, do the exercise, mm -hmm. you can either ask the question of if I have a telescope that has, you know, uh, surveyed this part of the sky? What are the chances that I would discover this clustering? And that basically tells you that you have zero confidence, right? Like that's not, that does not give you a confident answer one way or another. Another way to do the statistics, which is what we prefer to do, is to take, to say, we have a whole night sky mm -hmm. of discoveries in the Kuiper belt, right? And if we have some object over there, which has right ascension and declination, which is a way to say it's there on the sky, and it has some brightness, that means somebody looked over there and discovered an object of, was able to discover an object of that brightness or brighter. Mm -hmm. and through that analysis, you can construct a whole map on the sky of kind of where all of the surveys that have ever been done have collectively looked. So if you do the exercise this way, the false alarm probability of the clustering on which the Planet Nine hypothesis is built is about 0.4%. Wow, okay, so there's a million questions here. One, when you say bright objects, why, why are they bright? Are we talking about actual objects within the Kuiper Belt or the stuff we see through the Kuiper Belt? This is the actual stuff we see in the Kuiper Belt. The way you go about discovering Kuiper Belt objects, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's easy in theory, right? Hard in practice. Yeah. All you do is you take 
snapshots of the sky, right? Choose that direction, say, and take, you know, the high exposure snapshot. Mm -hmm. Then you wait a night and you do it again. And then you wait another night and you do it again. Objects that are just random stars in the galaxy don't move mm -hmm. on the sky, whereas objects in the solar system will slowly move. This is no different than if you're driving down the freeway, it looks like you know trees are going by you faster than the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. This is parallax. That's it. It's just they're reflecting light off of the sun and it's going back and hitting this. There's a little bit of a glimmer from the different objects that you can see based on the reflection from the sun. So like there, there's actual light, yep. but it's not darkness. That's right. These are just big icicles basically that are just reflecting sunlight back at you. It's then easy to understand why it's so hard to discover them because light has to travel to, you know, something like 40 times the distance um, mm -hmm. uh, between the earth and the sun and then get reflected back. Was that like an hour travel? Or uh, Yeah, that's right. That's something like that. Because the the earth to the sun is eight minutes, I believe. Um, and so something, you know, yeah, hours, in, yeah. yeah in that in, in that order of magnitude. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. So you have to like account for all of that. And then there's this huge amount of data, f pixels that are coming from the pictures. And you have to uh, integrate all of that together yeah. to paint a sort of like a high estimate of the different objects. Can you track them? Can you be like, that's Bob? Like, can you like? Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, one of them is is named Joe Biden. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not like, this is not even a joke. Right. Okay. It's, is there a Trump one or no? No, no. I don't, well, <laughs> not actually, yet. I don't know. I haven't checked for, for, for <laughs> that, but uh, like w the way it works is if you discover one, oh. you right away get a license plate for it. Okay. Mm. So like the first four numbers is the first year that this object has appeared on, you know, uh, in the data set, if you will. And then um, there's like this code that follows it, um, which basically tells you where in the sky it is, right? So one of the really interesting Kuiper Belt objects, which is very much part of the Planet Nine story is called uh, VP113, because Joe Biden was vice president at the time, you know, got nicknamed Biden. Um, <laughs> VP113, said? Yeah. He <laughs> got nicknamed Biden, beautiful. What's the fingerprint? for any particular object? Like, how do you know it's the same one? Okay. Or you just kind of like, yeah, from night to night and you take a picture, how do you know it's the same object? Yeah, so the way you know is it appears in almost exactly the same part of the sky, but except for move by, moves by. And this is why actually you need at least three nights, because oftentimes asteroids, which are much closer to the Earth, like will um, appear to move only slightly, but then on the third night will move away. So that third night is really there to detect acceleration. Mm -hmm. Now, the um, the thing that I didn't really realize until you know I started observing together with my partner in crime and all this, Mike Brown, is just the fact that for the first year when you make these detections, the only thing you really know with confidence is where it is on the night sky and how far away it is, mm -hmm. okay? That's it, you don't know anything about the orbit because over three days, the object just moves so little, right? The That whole motion on the sky is entirely coming from motion of the earth, mm -hmm. right? So the earth is kind of the car, the object is the tree and you see it move. Yeah. So then to get some confident information about what its orbit looks like, you have to come back a year later um, and then measure it again. Oh, interesting. So do three yeah. nights, then come back a year later and do another three nights. Yeah. So you get the velocity, the acceleration from the three nights, and then you have the maybe- The additional. The, the, the additional yeah. information. Because an orbit is basically described by six parameters. So mm -hmm. you at least need six independent points, but in reality, you need m many more observations to, to really pin down the orbit well. And from that, you're able to construct for that one particular object, an orbit, and then there's, of course, like how many objects are there? There's like four-ish thousand now. But like the, in the future, there could be like millions. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. So, so if, in fact, these things are hard to predict, but there's a new observatory called the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is coming online maybe next year. I mean, with COVID, these things are yeah. a little bit more uncertain, but 
um, they've actually been making great progress uh, with construction. And so that uh, telescope is just going to sort of scan the night sky um, every day automatically. And it's just it's such an efficient survey that it might um, increase the census of the distant Kuiper belt, the things that I'm interested in, by a factor of 100. I mean, that would be that would be really cool. And uh, yeah, that's a that's an incredible. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they might just find Planet Nine. Too. I mean, that's <laughs> like almost like literally pictures, like visually. I mean, sure, yeah. Like the first detection you make, all you know is where it is in the sky and how mm -hmm. far away it is. If something is, you know, five hundred times away from the sun, as far away from the sun as is the Earth, you know that's Planet Nine. That's when the story concludes. And then uh, you can study it. Now you can study. It, yeah. yeah. By the way. I'm gonna use that as like, I don't know, a pickup line or a dating strategy, like see the person for three days and then don't see them at all and then see them again in, in a year to determine the orbit. And over time, you figure out if sort of uh, from a cosmic perspective, this this whole thing works <laughs> yeah. out. I have no dating advice to give. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna use this as a metaphor to uh, to somehow yeah. to uh, map it onto the human condition. Okay, you mentioned the Kuiper belt. What's the Oort cloud? If you look at the Neptune orbit as uh, one, then the Kuiper belt is like one point three out there, yeah. and then we get farther and farther into the darkness. Right. What? What's so okay, the you've cloud? got the kind of main Kuiper belt, which is about say one point. 3, 1.5, um, then you have something called the scattered disk, which is kind of an extension of the Kuiper belt. It's a bunch of these long, uh, very elliptical orbits that hug the orbit of Neptune, but come out very far. So that, the scattered disk um, with the current senses, like the some of the longest uh, orbits we know of um, have, a semi-major axis, so half the orbit length, roughly speaking, of about a thousand, thousand times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Wow. Now, if you keep moving out, okay, eventually, once you're at sort of, you know, 10,000 to 100,000, roughly, that's where the Oort cloud is. Now, the Oort cloud is a distinct population of icy bodies and is distinct from the Kuiper belt. It's, in fact, it's so expansive that it ends roughly halfway between us and the next star. Um, its its edge is just dictated by to what extent does the solar gravity reach. Solar gravity reaches that far? Yeah. So it has to, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> In fact, the, Imagining this is a little bit overwhelming. So there's can, like a giant, like vast, icy rock thingy it's just... like a sphere it's like you know it's like it's an almost spherical structure that engulfs that encircles the sun and all the long period comets come from the Oort cloud they come the way that they appear i mean for already i don't know hundreds of years we've been detecting and occasionally like a comet will come in and it comes seemingly comes out of nowhere yeah the reason these long period comets appear that very on very very long time scales, right? These Oort cloud objects that are sitting, you know, thirty thousand times as far away from the sun as is the Earth, actually interact with the gravity of the galaxy, the tide, the, effectively the tide that the galaxy mm -hmm. exerts upon them, and their orbits slowly change and they elongate mm -hmm. to the point where once they their closest approach to the sun starts to reach a critical distance where ice starts to sublimate, mm -hmm. then we discover them as comets because then the ice comes off of them. Wow. They look beautiful on the night sky, et cetera. But they're all coming from you know, really, really far away. So uh, is there, are any of them coming our way from collisions? Like how many collisions are there? Or is there a bunch of space for them to move around? Yeah, there's zero. Like the, it's completely collisionless out there the physical radii of objects are so small compared to the distance between them, right? It's just, it is truly a collisionless uh, environment. I don't know. There, I think that probably in the age of the solar system, there have literally been zero collisions in the Oort cloud. Wow. When you like draw a picture of the solar 
system that everything's really close together. So that everything I guess here is spaced far apart. Do rogue planets like fly in every once in a while and join? Not rogue planets, but rogue objects from out there. Oh, sure. Oh, and sure. Yeah. Join, this, join the party? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've seen a couple of them uh, in the last three or, or so years, uh, maybe four years now. Uh, one, the first one uh, was the one called Uamuamua. I mean, it's been all over the news. The second one was Comet Borisov, uh, discovered by a guy named Borisov. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the way you know they're coming from elsewhere is unlike solar system objects, which travel on elliptical paths around the sun, these guys tra travel on hyperbolic paths. Mm -hmm. So they come in, say hello, and then they're gone. And it, the fact that they exist is totally like not surprising, mm -hmm. right? The Neptune is con constantly ejecting Kuiper Belt objects into interstellar space. Our solar system itself is sort of leaking icy debris mm -hmm. uh, and, and ejecting it. So presumably every, you know, planetary systems around other stars do exactly the same thing. Let me ask you about the, the millions of objects that are part of the Kuiper Belt and the part of the Oort Cloud. Do you think some of them have primitive life? It kind of makes you sad. <laughs> if there's like primitive life there and they're just kind of like lonely out there in space. Yeah. Like how many of them do you think have life, like bacterial life? Probably a negligible amount. Zero, you know, like zero with like a plus on top, right? Uh, right? Zero so, plus plus. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> if so, you know, if you and I took a little trip to the interstellar medium, I think we would develop cancer and die uh, real fast, right? It's rough. Huh? Yeah, it's a pretty hostile radiation environment. Um, you don't actually have to go to the interstellar medium. You just have to leave the Earth's magnetic field to, um, and then you're not doing so well suddenly. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, this this idea of, you know, life kind of traveling between places, it's not it's not entirely implausible, but you you really have to twist, I think, a lot of parameters. One of the problems we have is we don't actually know how life originates, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of a second order question of, of survival in the interstellar medium mm -hmm. and, and how resilient it is because we we think you require water, but and that's certainly the case for the Earth. Mm -hmm. But you know, we uh, we really don't know for sure. That said, I will argue that the question of like are there aliens out there is a very boring question mm -hmm. because the answer is of course there are. <laughs> right. I mean, like, we know that there are planets around almost every star. Um, <laughs> of course, there. Of course, there are other life forms. Life is not some specific thing that happened on the Earth, and that's it. Right. Just that's a statistical impossibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the the difficult question is before even the fact that we don't know how life originates, I don't think we even know what life is, like definitionally. Yeah. Like formalizing a kind of picture of, in terms of the mechanism we would use to to search for life out there, or even when we're on a planet to say, is this life? <laughs> is this rock that just moved from where it was yesterday life? <laughs> or, or maybe life. not even a rock, something else. I gotta tell you, I wanna know what life is. <laughs> Okay, and I want you to show me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think there's a song to basically accompany every single <laughs> thing yeah. we talk about today, and, and probably uh, half of them are love songs. Um, and somehow we'll integrate George Michael into the whole thing. Okay, so your intuition is there's life everywhere in our universe. Do you think there's intelligent life out there? I think it's entirely plausible. I mean, I, it's entirely plausible um, you know, I think I think there's intelligent life on Earth, um, and so yeah, taking that like say whatever this thing we got on Earth, whether it's dolphins or humans, say that's intelligent. Uh, definitely dolphins. I mean, yeah, have so, you seen the dolphins? Well, they do some cruel stuff to each other. So if <laughs> cruelty <laughs> is uh, is a definition of intelligence, they're pretty good. Yeah, and then humans are pretty good in that uh, regard. And then there's like 
uh, uh, pigs are very intelligent. I got I got actually a chance to hang out yeah. with pigs recently, and they're um, aside from the fact they're trying to eat me, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're very uh, they're very they love food. They love food, but there's an intelligence to their eyes that was kind of uh, like haunts me because I also love to eat meat, mm -hmm. and then to to meet the thing I later ate. And that was very intelligent and uh, almost charismatic with the way it was expressing it, uh, himself, yeah. herself, itself, was uh, was quite incredible. So uh, all that to say is, if we have intelligent life here on Earth, if we take dolphins, pigs, humans, from the perspective of like planetary science, mm -hmm. how unique is Earth? Okay, so Earth is not a com common outcome of the planet formation process. Um, it's probably a something on the order of maybe a 1% effect. And by Earth, I mean Small. not just an Earth mass planet, mm -hmm. okay? I mean the architecture of the solar system that allows the Earth to exist in, in its kind of very temperate um, way. One thing to understand, uh, and this is, this is pretty crucial, uh, right, is that the Earth itself formed well after the gas disk that formed the giant planets um, had already dissipated. You see, stars start out with you know the star and then a disk of gas and dust that encircles it. Okay, from this disk of gas and dust, big planets can emerge, mm -hmm. and we have over the last uh, you know, two three decades discovered thousands of extrasolar planets mm -hmm. as an orbit of other stars. What we see is that uh, many of them are, you know, have these expansive hydrogen helium atmospheres. The fact that the Earth uh, doesn't is deeply connected to the fact that Earth took about 100 million years to form. So we missed that you know, train, so to speak, to get that hydrogen helium atmosphere. That's why actually we can see the sky. Right? That's why the sky is, uh, well, at least in most places, that's why the, the atmosphere is not completely opaque. Um, with that you know, kind of thinking in mind, I, I would argue that we're getting the kind of emergent pictures that the Earth is, is not you know, everywhere. Right? We, there's sort of the sci-fi view of things where we go to some other star and we just land on random planets and they're all Earth-like. That's totally not true. But the, even a low probability event, even if you imagine that Earth is a one in a million or one in a, you know, one in 10 million occurrence, there are 10 to the 12 stars in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Right, so you just you always win by by <laughs> large by numbers. Kind of, that's right by supply. They save you. Well, you've uh, hypothesized that our, our solar system once possessed a population of short period planets that were destroyed by the evil Jupiter mm -hmm. uh, migrating through uh, the the solar nebula. Can you explain? If I was to say what was the key, kind of the key outcome of searches for extrasolar planets. It is that most stars are encircled by short period planets that are, um, you know, a few Earth masses, right? So a few times bigger than the Earth, um, and have orbital periods that kind of range from days to to weeks. Okay. Oh, wow. Now, if you go and ask the solar system what's in our region, right? In that region, it's completely empty, right? It's just it's astonishingly hollow. And I think, you know, from the sun is not some, you know, special star that decided that it was going to form the, the solar system. So I think, you know, the natural thing to assume is, to, is that the same processes of planet formation that occurred everywhere else also occurred in the solar system. Following this logic, it's not implausible to imagine that the solar system once possessed a system of intra- Mercurian, like, you know, compact system of, of planets. So then we asked ourselves, would such a system survive to this day? And the answer is no. Uh, at least our calculations uh, suggest that it's highly unlikely because of the formation of Jupiter. 
and Jupiter's primordial kind of wandering through the solar system would have sent this collisional field of debris that would have pushed that system of planets onto the sun. So was Jupiter, this primordial wandering, what, what did what did Jupiter look like? Like, why was it wandering? It, yeah. it didn't have the orbit it has today? Uh, we're pretty certain that giant planets like Jupiter, when they form, they migrate. The reason they migrate is, uh, you know, on a detailed level, perhaps difficult to explain, but, you know, if just in a qualitative sense, uh, they form in this fluid disk of gas and dust. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, saying, okay, if I plop down a raft somewhere in the ocean, will it stay in the, where you plop it down or will it kind of get carried around? It's not really a good analogy because it's not like Jupiter is being advected by the currents of you know gas and dust, but the way it, it migrates is it carves out a hole in the in the disk and then uh, through by interacting with the disk gravitationally, right, it can change its orbit. The fact that the solar system has both Jupiter and Saturn here complicates things a lot, right? Because it's you have to solve the problem of the evolution of the gas disk, the evolution of Jupiter's orbit in the gas disk, plus the evolution of Saturn's and their mutual interaction. The common outcome of solving that problem, though, is pretty easy to explain. Jupiter forms, its orbit shrinks, and then once Saturn forms, its orbit catches up basically to the orbit of Jupiter and then both come out. Mm -hmm. So there's this inward outward pattern of Jupiter's uh, early motion that happens sort of within the, fir within the last million years of the lifetime of the solar system's primordial disk. So Ju while this is happening, if our calculations are correct, uh, which I think they are, you can destroy these inner, this inner system of, you know, few Earth mass planets. Mm -hmm. And then in the aftermath of all this violence, you form the terrestrial planets. Where, where would right? they come from in that case? So, so Jupiter clears out the space mm -hmm. and then there's a, a few terrestrial planets that come in and the, those come in from the, from the disk somewhere, so like they, one of the larger yeah, objects. They, what actually happens in these calculations is you leave behind a rather mass depleted like remnant, uh, gotcha. remnant disk, only a couple Earth masses. Yeah. So um, gotcha. then from that remnant population, annulus of material over a hundred, over a hundred million years, by just collisions, you grow the Earth and the moon and everything else. You said amulus? Annulus. Annulus. Annulus, yeah. That's a beautiful word. What does that mean? Well, it's like, a, it's like a disk that's kind of thin. Annulus. It's like a, yeah, it's something that is, you know, a disc that's so thin, it's almost flirting with being a ring. Like, I was gonna say, this reminds me of Lord of the Rings. So like this, the word just feels like it belongs in a Tolkien novel. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that that's incredible. And so that, in your senses, you said like 1%, that's a rare, the way Jupiter mm -hmm. and Saturn danced and cleared out and, you know, cleared out the, the, the short period uh, debris and then change the gravitational landscape that's a pretty rare thing to it's rare and moreover like you don't even have to go to our calculations you can just ask the night sky how many stars have jupiter and saturn analogs hmm. and the answer is jupiter and saturn analogs are found around only 10 percent of sun-like stars so they are they themselves like you kind of have to score an a minus or better mm -hmm. on the test to you know on the planet formation test to become a solar system analog, even in that basic sense. And moreover, um, you know, low, lower mass stars, which are uh, very numerous in the galaxy, so-called M dwarves, think like 0% of them, well, maybe like a negligible fraction of them have giant planets. Giant planets are a rare, you know, outcome of planet formation. One of the really big problems that remain unanswered is why. We don't actually understand why they're so rare. How hard is it to simulate all of the things that we've been talking about, each of the things we've been talking about, and maybe one day all of the things we've been talking about and beyond? Meaning, like from the initial primordial solar system, you know, a bunch of disks with 
I don't know, billions, trillions of objects in them. Like simulate that such that you eventually get a Jupiter and a Saturn. And then eventually you get the Jupiter and the Saturn that clear out a disk, change the gravitational landscape, then Earth pops up, like that whole thing. And then be able to do that for every other system in the uh, every other star in the galaxy, and then be able to do that for other galaxies as well. Um, yeah. So look, maybe start from the smallest yeah. simulation. Like, what is actually being done today? I mean, even the smallest simulation is probably super, super difficult. Even just like one object in the Kuiper Belt is probably super difficult to simulate. I mean, I think it's super easy. I okay. mean, like, it's <laughs> okay. it's just not that hard. Um, yeah. But um, you know, let's let's ask the most kind of basic problem. Okay, so the problem of having a star and something in orbit of it, that okay. you don't need a simulation for, like you can just write that down on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. There's gravity, what, like, yeah, I guess I guess it's important to try to, uh, you know, one way to simulate objects in our solar system is to build the universe from scratch. Okay, we'll get to building the universe okay. from scratch in a sec, um, but let me just kind of go through the hierarchy of what you know what, yeah. what we do two objects right. so two objects analytically solvable like we can figure it out very easily if you just you don't even, i don't think you yeah you don't need to know calculus uh, it helps to know calculus but you don't necessarily need to know calculus um three objects that are gravitationally interacting the solution is chaotic doesn't matter how many simulations you do you the answer loses meaning after um after some time i feel like that is a metaphor for dating as well but go on <laughs> now look yeah so so the fact that you go from analytically solvable to unpredictable you know when you are you know, when your simulation goes from two bodies to three bodies should immediately tell you mm -hmm. that the exercise of trying to engineer a calculation where you form the, solar, the entire solar system from scratch and hope to have some predictive answer is, is a futile one, right? We will never uh, succeed at such a simulation. So like, sorry, just to clarify, you mean like explicitly having a clear equation that generalizes the, the whole process enough to be able to make a prediction? Mm -hmm. Or do you mean actually like literally simulating the objects is a hopeless pursuit once it increases well, beyond three. The simulating them is not a hopeless pursuit, but the outcome becomes ah. a statistical one. Right. And what's actually quite interesting is I think we have all the equations uh, figured out, right? Like, right. you know, in order to really understand this, the formation of the, the solar system, it suffices to know gravity and magnetohydrodynamics. I mean, like the combination of uh, Maxwell's equations and you know Navier-Stokes equations for the fluids. You need to know quantum mechanics to understand opacities and and so on. But we have those equations in hand. It's not that we don't have that understanding. It's that putting it all together um, is a very very difficult. And b, if you were to run the same evolution twice changing, you know, the initial conditions by some infinitesimal amount, some, you know, minor change in your calculation to start with, you would get the you'd get a different answer. This is one this is part of the reason why planetary systems are so diverse. You don't have like a, you know, very predictive path for you start with a disk of this mass and it's around this star, therefore you're gonna form the solar system, mm. right? You start with this and therefore you will form this huge outcome, a huge set of outcomes and some percentage of it will resemble the solar system. You mentioned quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and we're, we're talking about cosmic scale objects. You've talked about that the evolution of astrophysical disks can be modeled with uh, Schrodinger's equation. I sure did. Wh why? <laughs> it's like, how does quantum mechanics uh, become relevant at when you uh, consider the evolution of objects in the solar system? Yeah. Well, let me take a take a step back and just say, it, like, I remember being, you know, utterly confused by quantum mechanics when when I first learned it. And the Schrodinger equation, which is kind of the parent equation of of that whole field, you know, seems to come out of nowhere, right? The way that 
yeah, the way that I was sort of explaining it, I remember asking, you know, my professor, I was like, but, but where does it come from? Is that like, well, it's just like, don't worry about it and just like calculate the hydrogen, you know, energy levels, right? So it's like I could do all the problems. I just did not have any intuition for, for where this parent, you know, super important equation came from. Now, down the line, I was, remember, I was preparing for my own lecture and I was trying to understand how waves um, travel in self-gravitating disks. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, there's a very broad theory that's already developed, but I was looking for some simpler way to explain it really for the purposes of teaching class. And so I, I thought, okay, what if I just imagine a disk as an infinite uh, number of concentric circles, right? That interact with, the, with each other gravitationally. That's a problem in some sense that um, I can solve using methods from like the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. right? so I can write down Hamiltonian, well, I can write down the energy function basically of their, their interactions. And what I found is that when you take the continuum limit, when you go from discrete circles that are talking to each other gravitationally to a continuum disk, suddenly, this gravitational interaction among them, right? The the governing equation becomes the Schrodinger equation. Yeah, and I had to think about that for a little bit. Did you just unify <laughs> quantum mechanics and gravity? No, this is not the same thing as like you know fusing relativity yeah. and quantum mechanics. But it did uh, it, it did get me thinking a little bit. So the fact that waves in astrophysical disks behave just like wave functions of, of particles. It's kind of like an interesting analogy because for me, it's easier to imagine waves traveling through, you know, astrophysical disks or really just sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is, um, that analogy exists is because there's actually nothing quantum about the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. The Schrodinger equation is just a wave equation and all of the interpretation that comes from it is quantum, but the equation itself is not a quantum being. So, so. you can use it to model waves. It's yes. wa It's not turtles, it's waves all the way down. You can pick which level you pick the, the wave at. And so it could be at the solar system level that you can use right. it. Right. And also it actually provides a, a pretty neat calculational tool because um, it's, it's, it's difficult. So we just talked about simulations, but it's difficult to simulate the behavior of astrophysical disks on time scales that are in between a few orbits and their entire evolution. Hmm. So it's over a time scale of a few orbits, you have you do a hydrodynamic, you know, simulation, right? You do um, that basically that's something that you can do on a modern computer on a time scale of say a week. Mm -hmm. When it comes to their evolution over their entire lifetime, you don't hope to resolve the orbits. You just kind of hope to understand how the system behaves in between, right? You to get access to that, as it turns out, it's pretty um it's pretty cute. You can use uh you can use the Schrodinger equation to get the answer rapidly. So it's a calculational tool. That's fascinating. By the way, the uh, astrophysical disks, how what are they? How broad is this definition? Okay. So astrophysical disks span a huge, uh huge amount of ranges. Uh, they start maybe at the smallest scale, they start with actually Kuiper belt objects. Some Kuiper belt objects have rings. Okay? So that's maybe the smallest example of an astrophysical disk. We've got this little potato shaped asteroid, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, sort of the size of LA or something. And around it is are some rings mm -hmm. of icy matter. That object is a small astrophysical disk. Then you have Saturn, mm -hmm. the rings of Saturn. You have the next set of scale, you have the solar system itself when it was forming, you have a disk. Then you have black hole disks, uh, you have galaxies. Disks are super common in the universe. And the reason is that stuff rotates, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> Gravity that's, works. Yeah. So, uh, and th those rings could be, the material that uh, composes those rings could be, it could be gas, it could be solid, it could be anything. That's right. So. Uh, the disk that made 
from which the planets emerged was predominantly hydrogen and helium gas. On the other hand, the rings of Saturn are made up of, you know, icicle, ice, little like ice cubes this big, about a centimeter across. That sounds refreshing. So uh, that's incredible, <laughs> hydrogen, helium, gas. So in the beginning, it was just hydrogen and helium uh -huh. around the sun. How does that lead to the first formations of solid objects mm -hmm. in terms of simulation? Okay, here's the story. Um, so you're like, have you ever been to the desert? <laughs> yes, I've okay. been to the Death Valley, and actually, it was uh, terrifying. Just a total tangent. I'm distracting you, no but I was uh, uh, driving through it, and I was really surprised because it was at first hot, and then as it was getting into the evening, there's this huge thunderstorm. Like yeah. it was raining, and it got freezing cold. I'm like, what the hell? Is it was the apocalypse. Yes. I had to like just sit there listening to Bruce totally. Springsteen. I remember, and just thinking, I'm probably going to die, and I was okay with it because Bruce Springsteen was on the radio. Look, when you've got the boss, you know, you're, you're ready. You're ready to meet the boss. Yeah. So look, I mean. That's a good line. So anyway, sorry. The desk, it's yes. true. Um, yeah, by the way, like to continue on this tangent, I, I absolutely love the Southwest for this reason. Just, uh, you know, I, during the pandemic, I drove from LA to New Mexico a bunch of times. The and, madness of weather. Yeah, the the chaos. the chaos of whether the fact that you know it'll be blazing hot one minute and then it's just like we'll decide to have a little thunderstorm. Maybe we'll decide to go back momentarily to like a thousand degrees and then go back <laughs> to the thunderstorm. It's amazing. It's it's that by the way is chaos theory in action. Yeah. Right. Um, but let's get back to talking about the desert. Yeah. So in the desert, uh, tumbleweeds have a tendency to roll because the wind rolls them. And if you're careful, you'll, you'll occasionally see this family of tumbleweeds where like there's like a big one and then there's a bunch of little ones that that kind of hide in its wake, mm -hmm. right? And are all rolling together and still almost looks like, you know, a family of ducks crossing a street yeah. or something. Um, or for example, you know, if you watch Tour de France, Right, you've got a whole bunch of cyclists, and they're like cycling, you know, within ten centimeters of each other. They're not BFFs, right? Yeah. They're not yeah. <laughs> trying to be <laughs> yeah. trying to ride together. Yeah. They are riding together to minimize the collective, um, you know, air resistance, if mm -hmm. you will, that uh, that they experience. Turns out, solids in the protoplanetary disk do just this. Um, there's an instability wherein solid particles, right? Things that are a centimeter across will start to hide behind one another and form these clouds. Why? Because cumulatively, that minimizes the solid component of the disk aerodynamic interaction with the gas. Mm -hmm. Now, these clouds, because they're kind of a favorable energetic condition for the dust to live in, they grow, 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 grow until they become so massive that they collapse under their own weight. Mm. That's how the first building blocks of planets form. That's how the big asteroids got there. That's incredible. Yeah. So that is that simulatable or is yeah. it not useful to simulate? No, no, that's simulatable. Um, and people do these types of calculations. It's, it's really cool. That's actually, that's one of the many fields of planet formation theory that is really, really active right now. People are trying to understand all kinds of aspects of that process because, of course, I've explained it. You know, like as if there's one thing that happens. Turns out, it's a it's a beautifully rich uh, dynamic. But the but qualitatively, formation of the first building blocks actually follows the same sequence as mm -hmm. formation of stars. Right? Stars are just clouds of gas, hydrogen, helium gas that's sit in space and slowly cool and at some point they you know contract to a point where their gravity overtakes the thermal you know pressure support if you will and they collapse under their own weight and you get a little baby solar system that's amazing so do you think one day it'll be possible to simulate the full history that took our solar system to what it is today yes and it will be useless Okay. <laughs> so you don't think your story, many of the ideas that you have about Jupiter clear in the space, like retelling that story in high resolution is not that important? I actually think it's important, but at every stage, you have to, 
you have to simulate you have to design your experiments your your numerical computer experiments so that they test some specific aspect gotcha. of that evolution Got it. um i am not a proponent of doing huge simulations because um even if we forget the information theory aspect of not being able mm -hmm. to simulate in full detail the universe because if you do then you you have made an actual universe it's not the simulation right by simulation is in some sense a compression mm -hmm. of information so therefore you lo must lose detail but that point aside if we are able to simulate the entire history of the solar system in excruciating detail i mean it'll be cool but it's not going to be any different from observing it right. right because theoretical understanding which is what ultimately i'm interested in um comes from taking complex things and reducing them down to something that you know some mechanism mm -hmm. that you can actually quantify um that's the that's the fun part of astrophysics just kind of simulating things in extreme detail is will cool will make cool visualizations but that doesn't get to doesn't doesn't get you to any better understanding than you had before you did the simulation if you ask very specific questions then you'll be able to uh create like very highly compressed nice beautiful theories about how things evolved and then you can use those to then generalize to other solar systems to uh, other stars and other galaxies and then say something generalizable about the entire universe how difficult would it be to simulate our solar system such that we would not know the difference meaning if we are living in a simulation is there a nice think of it as a video mm, game sure. is there a nice compressible way of doing that or just kind of like you intuited with a three body situation is just a giant mess that you cannot create a video game that uh, will seem realistic without actually building well, universe so, from scratch. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm speculating, but <laughs> one of the, yeah, I know, I know you, like, you have a deep understanding of this, uh, but like my, for me, I, I'm, I'm just gonna like speculate that for um, at least, in the types of simulations that we can do today, inevitably you run into the problem of resolution, right? You're, doesn't matter what you're doing, it is discrete. Now, um, the way you would go about asking, you know, if what we're observing, is that a simulation or, uh, or is that, you know, some real continuous thing, uh, is you, you zoom in, right? You zoom in and try and find the, you know, the grid scale, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really interesting it's a really interesting question, and because the solar system itself, and really, you know, the double pendulum is chaotic, right? Pendulum sitting on another pendulum it moves unpredictably once you let them go. Um, you really don't need to like inject any randomness into a simulation for it to, to give you stochastic and unpredictable answers. Weather is a great example of this. Weather has a lap of time of, you know, typical weather systems have a lap of time of a few days. I mean, there's a fundamental reason why the force forecast always sucks, you know, two weeks in advance. It's not that we don't know the equations that govern the atmosphere, we know them well. Their solutions are meaningless though, after a few days. The zooming in thing is very interesting. I, I, I think about this a lot, whether there'll be a time soon where we would want to stay in video game worlds, whether it's virtual reality or just playing video games. I mean, I think that time like came in like the 90s and it's been that time. Well, it's not just, it's not just came, it's, I mean, it's accelerated. I just recently saw that WoW and Fortnite were played 140 billion hours. And those are just video games. Yeah. And that's like increasing very, very quickly, especially with the people coming up now and being born now and become, you know, becoming yeah. teenagers and so on. Let's have a thought experiment where it's just you and a video game character inside a room where you remove the simulation, the need to simulate sort of um, 
a lot of objects. If it's just you and that character, how far do you need to simulate in terms of zooming in for it to be very real to you, oh, as real as uh, yeah. reality? So like, first of all, mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned zooming in, which is fascinating because we have these tools of science that allow us to zoom in, quote unquote, in all kinds of ways uh, uh, in the world around us, but our cognitive abilities, like our perception system as humans, is very limited in terms of zooming oh, sure. in. So yeah. we might be very easily fooled. Some of the video games, like on the PS4, yeah. like look pretty real to me, yeah. right? Uh, I think you, know, right. you would really have to interrogate. Uh, I mean, I think even with what we have today, like. Uh, I don't know, Ace Combat 7 is yeah. a great example, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the way that the clouds are rendered, uh, it's, I mean, it looks just like when you're flying, you know, on a real airplane, the, yeah. the kind of transparency. I think that the, you know, our perception is limited enough already yeah. to not be able to tell some of the, uh, you know, some of the differences. There's a game called uh, Skyrim. It's an Elder Scrolls role-playing game. And I just, uh, I played it for quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I, th <laughs> I think I played it very different than others. Like there'll be long stretches of time where I would just walk around and look at nature in the game. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Oh, sure. It's just like the graphics is like, wow, I wanna stay there. It was better, I went hiking recently. It was like as good as hiking. <laughs> so look, I know what you mean. Not to go on a huge video game, you Let's know, go. tangent, but like the the third like Witcher game mm -hmm. was astonishingly beautiful, right? Especially like playing on on a good hardware machine. It was like this is pretty, this is pretty legit. That said, um, you know, I I don't resonate with the I want to stay here. You know, like one of the things that I love to do is to go to my like boxing gym and and box with a guy right like that's there's there's nothing quite like that physical you know experience like that's fascinating that yeah. might be simply an artifact of the year you were born maybe because if you're born today it almost seems like stupid to go to a gym yeah <laughs> like you're going to a gym to box with a guy. Why not box with Mike Tyson when you yourself is a, like in his prime? When you yourself are also an incredible boxer well, in the so video there, game world. For me, there there's a multitude of reasons why I don't want to <laughs> box with Mike Tyson. Right? Like, I, <laughs> no, 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 no. I you, enjoy <laughs> teeth, you know, <laughs> and I want to have an ear. No, but your your skills in this meat space in this physical yeah. realm is very limited and it takes a lot of work. And you're you're uh, you're a musician. Uh, you're an incredible scientist. You have, only have so much time in the in the day, mm -hmm. but in the video game world, you can expand your capabilities in all kinds of dimensions that you can never have possibly have time in the physical world. And so that it doesn't make sense, like to to be existing, to be working your ass off in the physical world when you can just be super successful uh, uh, in, in the video game world. But I still. You enjoy I, sucking at stuff? <laughs> yeah, I, I really and struggling do. to get better. <laughs> I sure do. I mean, I think like these days with music, music is a great example, right? We just started, you know, practicing live uh, with my band again, you know, after not playing for a year. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was terrible. Like, right? we was just kind of a lot of the nuance, you know, a lot of the detail is just that detail that takes, you know, years of collective practice to develop uh, is just lost, but it was just an incredible amount of fun. Way more fun than all the like studio, you know, sitting around and playing uh, that I did, you know, throughout the entire year. So I think there's something, there's something intangible or maybe, maybe tangible about being, uh, being in person. I, I sure hope you're wrong and that, you know, we, that's not something that will get lost because I think there's like such a large part of the human condition is to hang out. If we were doing this interview uh, on Zoom, yeah. right? I mean, I'd already be, I'd already be bored out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's something to that. I'm, I mean, I'm almost playing devil's advocate, but at the same time, you know, I'm sure people talk about the same way at the beginning of the 20th century about horses, where they're they are much more efficient. They're 
much uh, easier to maintain than cars. It doesn't make sense to have, you know, all the ways that cars break down and there's not enough infrastructure in terms of roads for cars. It doesn't make any sense. Like horses totally. and like yeah. nature, you could do the nature, like where, you know, you should be living more natural life. Those are real. You don't want machines in your life that are going to pollute your mind and the minds of young people. But then eventually just cars took over. So in that same way, it just seems- uh, Going back to horses. <laughs> uh, I'm just you know <laughs> well you can be you can play uh uh, uh what is it red dead <laughs> red dead redemption yeah. redemption and uh, you can ride horses in the video game world that's true so <laughs> let me return us back to planet nine uh-huh always a good place to come back to so now that we did a big historical overview of our solar system what is planet nine okay planet nine is a hypothetical object that orbits the solar system right, at an orbital period of about 10,000 years. And um, an orbit which is uh, slightly tilted with respect to the plane of the solar system, slightly eccentric. And the object itself, we think, is five times more massive than the Earth. We have never seen Planet Nine in a telescope, but we have gravitational evidence for it. And so this is where all the stuff we've been talking about, this clustering ideas, maybe you can speak to the approximate location that we suspect. And also the question I wanted to ask is, uh, what are we supposed to be imagining here? Because you said there are certain objects in the Kuiper Belt that are kind of have a direction to them, that they're all like, like flocking in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that's a sense that there's some kind of gravitational object, not changing their orbit, but kind of, Confining them, right? Yeah. Confining, the, like grouping their orbits together. See, what would happen if Planet Nine were not there is these orbits that roughly share a common orientation, they would just disperse, mm -hmm. right? They would just become azim azimuthally symmetric, point everywhere. Planet Nine's gravity m makes it such that these objects stay in a state that's, that's basically anti-aligned with respect to the orbit of Planet Nine. Um, and and sort of hang out there and kind of oscillate on time scale of about a billion years. That's one of the lines of evidence for the existence of Planet Nine. There are others. That's the one that's easiest to maybe visualize just because it's fun to think about orbits that all point into the same direction. But I should um, you know emphasize that, for example, the existence of objects again, Kuiper Belt objects that are heavily out of the plane of the solar system, things that are tilted by, say, 90 degrees, that's not, uh, we don't expect that as an outcome of planet formation. Indeed, planet formation simulations have never produced such objects without some extrinsic gravitational force. Mm -hmm. Planet Nine, on the other hand, generates them very readily. So that uh, provides kind of an alternative, you know, population of small bodies in the solar system that also get produced by Planet Nine through an independent kind of gravitational effect. So they're kind of, there's basically five different things that the uh, that Planet Nine does individually that are like kind of maybe a one sigma effect where you'd say, yeah, okay, if that's all it was, maybe it's not, no reason to jump up and down, but because it's it's mul it's a multitude of these puzzles that all are explained by one hypothesis. That's that's really the the magnetism, the attraction of the Planet Nine model. So, can you just clarify? Mm -hmm. So, most orbit most planets in the solar system orbit at approximately the same. So right. it's flat. Yeah, it's like one degree. The the difference between them is a, about one degree. So, but nevertheless, if we looked at our solar system, it would look, and like could see every single object, it would look like a sphere. The inner part where the planets are would look like, flat. you know, flat, right? The, mm -hmm. the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt have a larger, um, so it gets fatter and fatter and yeah, fatter until like it becomes they, a sphere. That's right. And if you look at the very outside, it's cool. polluted by this, you know, Quasi spheroidal thing. Nobody's, of course, ever seen the Oort cloud, right? We've only seen comets that come from the Oort cloud. So the Oort cloud, which is this, right, population of distant debris, its existence is also inferred 
you could say alternatively there is you know there's a big cosmic creature that occasionally you know sitting at 20,000 AU and occasionally throws an icy oh, rock towards the sun sp like that spaghetti monster i think right. it's called okay yeah. i mean <laughs> So, so it's a mystery in many ways, but you can kind of infer a bunch of things about it. It's, it's, by the way, both terrifying and exciting that there's this vast darkness all around us that's full of objects that they're just throwing. They're just there, yeah. They're it's there. it's actually kind of astonishing, right, that we have only explored a small fraction of the solar system, right? That that really yeah. kind of baffles me because uh, I remember as a student, you know, studying physics. You know, you do the problem where you put the earth around the sun, you solve that and like it's one line of math and you say, okay, well that surely was figured out by Newton. Yeah. So like all the interesting stuff is not in the solar system, but that um, it's just plainly not true. There are, there are mysteries in the solar system that are remarkable that we are only now starting to just kind of scratch the surface of. And some of those objects probably have some information about the history of our solar system. Absolutely, absolutely. Like a great example is, um, you know, small meteorites, right? Small meteorites are melted, right? They have, they're differentiated, meaning some of the uh, iron sinks to core. You say, well, how can that be? Because they're so small that they wouldn't have melted just from the heat of their accretion. Mm -hmm. Turns out, the fact that the solar nebula, the the disk that made the planets, was polluted by aluminum twenty six is in itself a remarkable thing. It means the solar system did not form in isolation; it mm -hmm. formed in a giant cloud of thousands of other stars that were also forming. Some of which were undergoing, you know, going through supernova explosions. Some of uh, and releasing these unstable isotopes um, that of which we now see kind of the traces of. It's so cool. Do you think it's possible that life from other solar systems was injected and that that was what was uh, the origin of life on Earth? That, yeah, the panspermia idea. Um, that That's seen as a low probability event by people who studied the origin of life, but that's because uh, then they would be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think they'd be out of the job because you just then say you have to figure out how life started there. But then you have to go there. We can study life on Earth much easier. We could study it in the lab much easier because we could replicate conditions that are from an early um, Earth much easier from a chemistry perspective, from a biology perspective. You can intuit a bunch of stuff. You can look at different parts of Earth and just... To an extent, I mean, the early Earth was completely unlike the current Earth, right? Yeah. There was no oxygen. So uh, one of my colleagues at Caltech, uh, Joe Kirschnick, uh, is um, certain, right? Well, something like 100% certainty <laughs> that life started on Mars and came to Earth uh, in on Martian meteorites. Um, this is not... <laughs> a problem that I like to kind of think about too much, like the origin of life. It's a fascinating problem, but you know, it's not physics. And I just like, I just don't, don't love it. It's the same reason you don't love, I, I thought you're a musician. So yeah. mu music is not physics either. So why, no, why are you so into hundred percent physics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, no, look, uh, in all seriousness though, I, uh, there are a few things that I really, really enjoy. I genuinely enjoy physics. I genuinely enjoy music. I genuinely, you know, enjoy martial arts, and I genuinely enjoy uh, my family. I should have said that all in a reverse order or something. But I like to focus on these things and, and not worry too much about about everything else. You know what I mean? Yes. Just because there is a, like you said earlier, there's a time constraint. You can't do it all. There's many mysteries all around us. So, um, and they're all beautiful in in different ways. To me, that thing I love is artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps I love it because eventually I'm trying to suck up to our future overlords. The, um, the question of, you said there's a lot of kind of little pieces of evidence for this thing that's planet nine. If we were to try to collect more evidence or be certain like a paper that says, like you drop it, clear, we're done. What what does that require? Does that require mm -hmm. us sending probes out 
or do you think we can do it from telescopes here on Earth? What are, what are the different ideas for conclusive evidence for Planet Nine? The moment Planet Nine gets imaged from a telescope on Earth, it's done. I mean, it's just there. Can you clarify, because you, you mentioned that before, from an image, would you be able to tell? Yes, so from an image, the moment you see something, something that is reflecting sunlight back at you, and you know that it's hundreds of times as far away from ah. the sun as is, as is the Earth, you're done. So you're, you're thinking, so basically, if you have a really far away thing that's big, yeah. you know, five times the size of Earth, that means uh, that, that, that's is, planet nine. that is planet nine. Could there be multiple objects like that? I guess. In principle, yeah. I mean, there's no there's no law of physics that uh, that doesn't allow you to have multiple objects. There's also no evidence at present for right. there being multiple but objects. I wonder if there, it's possible, so it's like, just like we're finding exoplanets, mm -hmm whether given the size of the Oort cloud, there's basically, it's rare and rare, but there's sprinkled planet nine, 10, 11, 12, like these, yeah. some- Got 13. Yeah, it goes after yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I can just so. keep counting. <laughs> so like just something about the dynamic yeah. system, like it becomes lower and lower probability event, but they gather up, like they, they become, would they become larger and larger maybe? Something like that. And I wonder, I wonder if like discovering planet nine will, will just like be almost like a springboard. It's like, well, what's, what's beyond that? It's entirely plausible. The Oort cloud itself probably holds about five earth masses or seven earth masses of material, um, right? So it's not, it's not nothing. And the, it all ultimately comes down to at what point will the observational surveys sample enough of the solar system to uh, kind of reveal interesting things. Mm -hmm. There's a great analogy here with Neptune and the story of how Neptune was discovered. Neptune was not discovered by looking at the sky, right? It was discovered by, uh, it was discovered mathematically, right? So uh, yeah, the orbit of Uranus, when Uranus was found, um, this, this was 1781, uh, it's they kind of, tracking uh, both the tracking of the orbit of Uranus as well as the reconstruction of the orbit of Uranus immediately revealed that it was not following the orbit that it was supposed to, right? The, the predicted orbit deviated away from where it actually was. So uh, in the mid 1800s, right? Um, a French mathematician by the name of Orban Le Verrier did a beautifully sophisticated calculation which said, if this is due to gravity of a more distant planet, then that planet is there, mm -hmm. okay? And then they found it. But the point is the understanding of where to look for Neptune came entirely out of celestial mechanics. The case with planet nine is a little bit different because what we can do, I think relatively well, is predict the orbit and mass of planet nine. We cannot tell you where it is on its orbit. The reason is we haven't seen the Kuiper Belt objects complete an orbit, their own orbit, mm -hmm. even once because it takes four thousand years. But you know, I plan to live on as an AI being, uh, and you know, I'll I'll be tracking those uh, those orbits as it's all you know, it takes four, four or five thousand years. I mean, it, could, it doesn't have to be AI; it could be longevity. There's a lot of really exciting genetic engineering research. So you'll you'll just be a brain waiting for the <laughs> for the your brain waiting for the orbit to complete for the basic Kuiper Belt objects. That's that's right. That's like kind of the worst reason to want to live a long time, <laughs> right? Just like, can the brain like smoke a cigarette? I know, right? Can you <laughs> just, just like <laughs> light one up while you're waiting or? Uh, <laughs> but you're making me actually realize that the one way to explore the the galaxy is by just sitting here on earth and waiting. So if we can just get really good at waiting, it's like yeah. a Muamua or these interstellar objects that fly in you can just wait for them to come to you. Same with the aliens. You can wait for them to come to you. If you get really good at waiting, um, then that's one way to do the exploration because eventually the thing will come to you. Maybe that's the entire, maybe the 
intelligent alien civilizations get much better at waiting. And so they all decide, so game theoretically to start waiting. And it's just a bunch of like ancient intelligent civilizations of aliens all throughout the universe. They're just sitting there waiting for each other. Look, you can't just be good at waiting. You got to know how to chill. Okay. Like, like <laughs> you right. can't just like sit around and do nothing. You got to be, you got, you got to know how to chill. I honestly think that as we progress, mm -hmm. if the aliens are anything like us, we enjoy loving things we do. And it, it, it's, uh, it's very possible that we just figure out mechanisms here on earth to enjoy our life. And we just yeah. stay here on earth for, uh, forever that exploration becomes less and less of an interesting thing to do. And so you basically, yes, wait and chill. <laughs> yeah. You get really optimally good at chilling and thereby exploring is not that uh, interesting. So yeah. in, in terms of 4,000 years, it would be nothing for scientists. We'll be chilling and just all kinds of scientific explorations will become possible because we'll just be here on earth so chill <laughs> so chill so chill you have a paper out recently because you, you already mentioned some of these ideas but i'd mm -hmm. love it if you could dig into it a little bit yeah, of course the injection of inner or mm -hmm. cloud objects into the distant kuiper belt by planet nine what is this idea of uh planet nine injecting objects into the kuiper belt okay let me take a, a brief step back and say when we do calculations of planet nine when we do the simulations as far as our simulations are concerned, sort of the uh, Neptune, like kind of the, the Nep trans Neptunian solar system is entirely sourced from the inside. Namely, the Kuiper belt gets scattered by Neptune, and then Planet Nine does things to it and aligns the orbits and, and so on. And then we calculate what, uh, what happens on the lifetime of the solar system, yada, yada, yada. Um, during the pandemic, one of the kind of questions we asked uh, ourselves, and this is indeed something we, Mike and I, uh, Mike Brown, who's a partner in crime on this, and I do regularly, is we say, how can we, A, disprove ourselves, and B, how can we improve our simulations? Like, what's missing? Mm -hmm. And one idea we, that maybe should have been obvious in retrospect is that all of our simulations treated the solar system as some isolated creature, right? But the solar system did not form in isolation, right? It formed in this cluster of stars. And during that phase of forming together with thousands of other stars, we believe the solar system formed this almost spherical population of icy debris that sits maybe at a few thousand times the <clears throat> separation between the Earth and the Sun, maybe even a little bit closer. If Planet Nine's not there, that population is completely dormant. And right? these objects just slowly orbit the, the Sun. Nothing interesting ha happens to them ever. But what we realize is that if Planet Nine is there, Planet Nine can actually grab some of those objects and gravitationally re-inject them mm -hmm. into the distant solar system. So we thought, okay, let's look into this with numerical experiments. Do do our simulations? Does this process work? And if it works, uh, what are its consequences? So it turns out, indeed, not only does Planet Nine inject these distant um, inner Oort cloud objects into the Kuiper Belt, they follow roughly the same pathway as the um, as the objects that are being scattered out. So there's this kind of river, two-way river of mm -hmm. material. Some of it is coming out mm -hmm. from, you know, by Neptune scattering, some of it is moving in. And if you work through the numbers, you kind of, at the end of the day, that it, it has an effect on the best fit orbit for planet nine itself. So if you realize that the data set that we're observing is not entirely composed of things that came out of the solar system, but also things that got re-injected back in, then turns out the best fit planet nine is slightly more eccentric. That's kind of getting into the weeds. The, the point here is that um, you know, the existence of planet nine itself provides this natural bridge 
that connect an otherwise dormant population of icy debris of the solar system with things that we're starting to directly observe. So it can flow back, so it's not just a river yeah. flowing one way, it's a, maybe a smaller stream yeah. going back. And it's backwash. You, you yeah. want to backwash. You want to incorporate <laughs> that into the simulations, into your understanding of those distant objects when you're trying to make mm -hmm. sense of the various observations and so on. Exactly. That's fascinating. I got to ask you, some people think mm -hmm. that... Uh, many of the observations that you're describing could be described by a primordial black hole. First, what is a primordial black hole and what do you think about this idea? Yeah, so a primordial black hole is a black hole which is made not through the usual pathway of making a black hole, um, which is that you have a star, which is uh, more massive than you know 1.4 or so solar masses. And basically when it runs out of fuel, uh, runs out of its nuclear fusion fuel, it can't hold itself up anymore and just the whole thing collapses on itself, right? Yep. You create a, um, I mean, one, I guess, simple way to think about it is you create an object with zero radius uh, that has mass but zero radius, that singularity. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's, such black holes exist all over the place. In the galaxy, there's in fact, a really big one at the center of the galaxy yeah, that's that like, yeah, me. That, that one's always looking at you when you're not looking, okay? <laughs> right, it, and it's it's always talking about you. And when you turn off the lights, it's it, it wakes up. That's right. <laughs> um, but you know, so such black holes are all over the place. We When they merge, we get to see, you know, incredible gravitational waves that they emit, et cetera, et cetera. One kind of plausible scenario, however, is that when the universe was forming, basically during the Big Bang, you created a whole spectrum of black holes, uh, some with masses of five Earth masses, some with masses of 10 Earth masses, like the entire, you know, mass spectrum size, the ma some, the, mass of asteroids. Now, on the smaller end, over the lifetime of the universe, the smaller ones kind of evaporate uh, and they're not there anymore. At least this is what we, uh, what the calculations tell us. Um, but five Earth masses is big enough to not have evaporated. So one idea is that planet nine is not a planet and instead it is a five Earth mass black hole. And that's why it's hard to find. Now, um, can we right away from our calculations say that's definitely true or that's not true? Absolutely not. We can't, in fact, our calculations tell you nothing other than the orbit and the mass. Mm -hmm. And that means the black hole, I mean, it could be a five earth mass, you know, cup. Mm -hmm. It could be a five earth mass hedgehog or a black hole or, or really mm -hmm. anything that's five earth masses will do because the gravity of a black hole is no different than the gravity of a planet, right? If the sun became a black hole tomorrow, it would be dark, but the earth would keep orbiting it. In the, like this notion that, oh, black holes suck everything in, it, it's it's not, that's like a sci-fi notion. Right, it's just mass. What would be the difference between a black hole and a planet in terms of observationally? Uh, observationally, the difference would be that you will never find the black hole, right? The truth is they're kind of, um, I'm actually not, you know, I never looked into this very carefully, but there, there are some constraints that you can get just statistically say, okay, if the sun has a binary companion, which is a five earth mass black hole, then that means bla such black holes would be extremely common. And you know you yeah. can sort of look for lensing events and then you say, okay, maybe that's not so likely. But you know, that said, I wanna emphasize that there's a limit to what our calculations uh, can tell you. That's the orbit and the mass. So I think there's a bunch, like Ed Witten, I mm -hmm. think wishes it's a black hole <laughs> because mm -hmm. I think one exciting things about black holes in our solar system is that we can go there and we can maybe study the singularity somehow because yeah. that allows us to understand some fundamental things about physics. If um, it's a planet, so planet nine, we may not, you know, and we go there, we may not discover anything profoundly new. The interesting thing, perhaps you can correct me about mm -hmm. planet nine is like the big picture of it. The whole big story of the Kuiper belt and all those kinds of things. It's not, 
that Planet Nine would be somehow fundamentally different from um, from I don't know Neptune uh, in terms of um, in terms of the kind of things we can learn from it. So I think that there's kind of a hope that it's a black hole because it's an entirely new kind of object. Yeah. Maybe you can uh, correct me. On, uh, on, well, yeah, on I mean, uh, of course, here my own biases creep in because I'm interested, you know, in planets around other stars. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I would disagree that, you know, we wouldn't find things that would be truly, you know, fundamentally new. Um, because as it turns out, the the galaxy is really good at making five or three Earth mass objects, mm -hmm. right? The most common type of planet that we see, that we you know discover orbiting around other stars is a few Earth masses. Mm -hmm. In the solar system, there's no analog for that, right? We go from one Earth mass object, which is this one, and to skipping to Neptune and Uranus, which themselves are actually relatively poorly understood, I would say, especially Uranus from the interior structure point of view. If planet nine is a planet, going there will give us the closest window into understanding what other planets look like. And um, I will, you know, I'll say this, that, you know, planets kind of in terms of their complexity on some logarithmic scale, fall somewhere between a star and an insect, right? An insect is way more complicated than a star, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just there's all kinds of physical processes and really biochemical processes mm -hmm. that occur inside of an insect that just make a star look like, you know, somebody is like playing with a spring or something, yeah. right? So the I, I think, you know, it would be, you know, arguably, you know, more interesting to go to, um, you know, to go to planet nine if it's a planet, because black holes are simple. They're just kind of, they're basically macroscopic, like particles, Yeah. right? And just, so- Just like the star yeah. that you mentioned in terms of complexity. So it, it's possible that planet nine, as opposed to being like homogeneous, is like super, like heterogeneous, there's a bunch of cool stuff going on. Absolutely. That could give yeah. us an intuition. I never thought about that, that it's just basically earth number two in terms of size and gives us starts giving us intuition that could be generalizable to earth-like planets elsewhere in the galaxy. I mean, yeah, Pluto is also in the sense like, you know, Pluto is a tiny tiny thing, right? Just like you would imagine as just a tiny ball of ice, like who cares? But the New Horizons images of Pluto reveal so much remarkable structure, right? They reveal glaciers flowing and these are glaciers not made out of water ice, but, you know, CO ice. It turns out at those temperatures, right, of like 40 or so Kelvin, water ice looks like metal, right? It just doesn't flow at all. But then ice made up of carbon monoxide starts to flow. I mean, there's just like all kinds of really cool uh, phenomena that you otherwise just wouldn't really even imagine uh, that occur. So, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why I like planets. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, I find, uh, as I read, the idea that Ed Witten was mm -hmm. thinking about this kind of stuff fascinating. So he he's a mathematical physicist uh, who's uh, very interested in string theory, mm -hmm. won the Fields Medal uh, for his work in mathematics. So I read that he proposed a fleet of probes accelerated by radiation pressure that could discover a planet nine primordial black hole's location. Uh, what do you think about this idea of sending a bunch of probes out there? Yeah, look, uh, the way the the idea is a cool one, right? You go and you say, you know, launch them basically isotropically. You track where they go, and uh, if I understand the idea correctly, you basically measure the, the deflection, and you say, okay, that must be something there since the the probe trajectories are being altered. Oh, so the measurement, the, the basic sensory mechanism is the, it's not like you have sensors on the probes, it's more like you're, because you're very precisely able to capture, to measure the trajectory of the probes, you can then infer the gravitational yeah. fields. And I think I think that's the basic idea. Um, you know, back a few years ago, we had conversations like these with, um, you know, engineers from JPL, they more or less convinced me that 
this is more, much more difficult than it seems because you don't, at that level of precision, right? Things like solar flares matter, right? Solar flares, right, are completely chaotic. You can't predict which, where a solar flare will happen. That will drive radiation pressure gradients. You don't know where every single asteroid is. So like actually doing that um, problem, I think it's possible, but it's it's not a trivial matter, right? Well, I, I wonder not just about Planet Nine. I wonder if that's kind of the future of doing science in our solar system is to just launch a huge number of probes. So like a whole order of magnitude, many orders of magnitude, larger numbers of probes, and then start to infer a bunch of different stuff, not just gravity, but everything yes. else. So in this regard, I actually think there is a huge revolution that's to some extent already started, right? The standard kind of like time scale for a NASA mission is that you like propose it and it launches, I don't know, like 150 years after you propose, I'm over exaggerating, but yeah. you know, it's yeah. just like some huge development cycle yeah. and it gets delayed 55 times. Yeah. Like that is not going away, <laughs> yeah. right? The, the really cutting edge things, you have to do it this way because you don't know what you're building, so to speak. But the CubeSat kind of world is starting to, um, you know, provide an avenue for like, you know, launching something that costs, you know, a few million dollars and has a turnaround time scale of like a couple of years. You can imagine doing, you know, PhD theses where you design the mission, the mission goes to where you're going and you do the science all within a time span of five, six years. That is, has not been fully executed on yet, but I absolutely think that's on the horizon and we're not talking a decade. I think we're talking like this decade. Yeah, and the company is accelerating all this uh, with uh, Blue Origin and, mm -hmm. and uh, SpaceX. And there's a bunch of more CubeSat sure. oriented companies that are pushing this forward. Uh, well, let me, ask you, yeah. uh, let me ask you on that topic. What do you think about either one? Elon Musk with SpaceX, uh, going to Mars, I think he wants SpaceX to be the first, to put a first human on Mars. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jeff Bezos, gotta give him props, wants to be the first to fly his own rocket <laughs> out into space. So you know, wasn't there a guy who like built his rocket out of garbage? Yeah. Uh, this was like a couple years ago and somewhere in the desert, he he launched himself. I'm not tracking this closely, but I think I am familiar with folks who built their own rocket to try to prove the earth is flat. Yes, that's the guy that's I'm talking guy. about. Yeah, he was also like, he also jumped some limousine. Yeah. For <laughs> Truly revolutionary mind. That's I mean, you right. have that's to, right. uh, greater men than either you or I. But yeah. uh, what do you... <laughs> so look, it's been astonishing to watch how really over the last like decade, the commercial sector took over this, uh, you know, this industry that traditionally has really been like a, you know, a government thing to do. Um, Motivated primarily by the, the competition between nations, like mm -hmm. the Cold War. Sure. And now it's motivated more, more and more by the, for the natural forces of capitalism. Yes, that's right. So, um, Okay, here I have I have many ideas about it. I think on the one hand, right, like what SpaceX has been able to do, for example, phenomenal. Um, you, if that brings down the price of space exploration, that turnaround time scale for space exploration, which I think it inevitably will, um, that's a huge, you know, that's a huge boost to the to the human condition. The same time, right, if we're talking astronomy, right, they're they're also it comes at a huge cost, right? And the Starlink satellites is a great example of that cost, yeah. right? At one point, uh, in fact, I was just camping in the Mojave with a with a friend of mine, and they saw, you know, <laughs> this uh, this string of satellites just kind of like, a, you know, appear and then disappear uh, into nowhere. So that is beginning to interfere with, you know, Earth based observations. So I think. It's there's tremendous potential there. It's also important to be responsible about how it's executed. Now with Mars and the whole idea of you know exploring Mars, 
Right. I don't have like strong opinions on whether a manned mission is is required or or not required. Um, but I do think you know we need to focus. The thing to keep in mind is that I I generally kind of. Uh, I'm not signed on, if you will, to the idea that Mars is some kind of a safe haven that we can, mm-hmm. uh, you know, escape to, right? Mars sucks, right? Like living on Mars. If you if you want to live on Mars, like you can have that experience by going to the Mojave Desert and camping, and it's just like it's it's just not a great. Well, it's <laughs> interesting, but there's something captivating about that kind of mission of us striving out into space and by uh-huh. making Mars in some way habitable for at least like months at a time, I think would lead to engineering breakthroughs that would make life uh, like in many ways much better on earth. Like it would will come up with ideas we totally don't mm-hmm. expect yet, both on the robotic side, on the food engineering side, on the, you know, maybe like we'll switch from, we'll, 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 like there'll be huge breakthroughs in insect farming as as exciting as I find that idea to be. <laughs> that, yeah. that in, you know, our, in the ways we consume protein, maybe uh, it'll revolutionize, we do factory farming, which is full of cruelty and, you know, mm-hmm. and torture of animals, we'll revolutionize that completely because of our, like we don't, we shouldn't need to go to Mars to revolutionize life here on earth. But at the same time, I shouldn't need a deadline to get shit done, but I do need it. And then the same way, I think we need Mars. There's something about the human spirit that loves that longing for I, I agree with that thesis. The going to the moon, right? And the, the that whole endeavor has, you know, has captivated the imagination of so many. Mm-hmm. And it has uh, it has led to incredible kind of incredible ideas, really, and, and probably in nonlinear ways, right? Mm-hmm. Not like, okay, we went to the moon, therefore some person here has thought of this. And yes. that. In, in that similar sense, I think, you know, space exploration is, there's something, there's some real magnetism about it. And it's on a genetic level, right? Like yeah. we have this need to keep exploring, right? When we're done uh, with a certain frontier, we move on to the next frontier. All that I'm saying is that I'm not moving to Mars to live there permanently mm-hmm. uh, ever, you know? And I think that, you know, I'm glad you paid, you you noted the kind of degradation of the earth, right? I think that is a true kind of, the leading order challenge of our yeah, time. Yeah, great engineering. Yeah, that's that's right. a, a bunch of a bunch of engineering problems. I'm most interested in this space because, as I've uh, read extensively, it's apparently very difficult to have sex in space, mm-hmm. and so I just want that problem to be solved because I think once we solve the sex in space problem, we'll revolutionize sex here on Earth, thereby increasing the fun on Earth and. Um, the consequences of that can only be good. I mean, you can, you've got a clear plan, yeah. right? And and it sounds like, uh, you I'm know. I'm submitting we, proposals to NASA as we speak. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I keep no. getting rejected, I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need better diagrams. <laughs> better, better pictures. I should have thought of that. You a while ago mentioned that, you know, there's certain aspects in the history of the solar system and earth that resulted, that it could have resulted in an opaque atmosphere, mm-hmm. but it didn't. We can see the stars. Um, and uh, somebody mentioned to me a little bit ago, and just, it's almost like a philosophical question for you. Do you think humans, like human society would develop as it did or at all if we couldn't see the stars? It would be drastically different. Just dra- if it ever did develop. So I think some of the early developments, right? Of like- Fire and- You know, fire, you know. First of all, that atmosphere would be so hot because, you know, if you have an opaque atmosphere, the temperature at the bottom Mm -hmm. is is huge. Um, So we would be very different beings to start with. We'd have very different- But it could be cloudy in certain kinds of ways that you could still get- Okay, think about like a a greenhouse, right? A greenhouse, is cloudy effectively, uh, yeah. but it's it's super hot. Um, yeah, it's hard to avoid having an atmosphere. If you have an opaque atmosphere, 
Yeah. It's hard to, right? Venus is a great example, right? Venus is, I don't remember exactly how many degrees, uh, but it's hundreds in Celsius, mm -hmm. right? It's not a hundred, it's hundreds. Uh, even though it's only a little bit closer to the sun, that right. temperature is entirely coming from the fact that the atmosphere is thick. So it's this, a sauna of sorts. Yeah, yeah. You go there, you know, you feel refreshed after you come back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you stay there, I mean, it's, so, okay, take that as an assumption. This is a philosophical question, not a biological one. So mm -hmm. you have a life that develops under these extremely hot conditions. Yeah, so let's see. So much of the early evolution of mankind uh, was driven by exploration, yeah. right? And the kind of interest in stars originated in part as a tool to guide that exploration, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that in itself, I think would be a huge, yeah. uh, you know, a huge differential in the way that we, you know, our, our, our evolution on this planet. Yeah, I mean, stars, that's brilliant. So even in that aspect, but even in further aspects, uh, astronomy just shows up in basically every single development in the history of science up until the 20th century, mm -hmm. it shows up. So True. I wonder without that, if we had, we would have, if we would even get like calculus. Yeah, look, that's a great, I mean, that's a great point. Newton in part developed calculus because he was interested in understanding, explaining Kepler's laws, mm -hmm. right? In general, that whole mechanistic understanding of the night sky, right? Replacing a religious yeah. understanding where you interpret, yeah. you know, this is, you know, this whatever fire god riding his, you know, uh, little chariot across the sky, as opposed to, you know, this is some mechanistic set of laws that transformed humanity and arguably put us on the on the course that we're on today right the entirety of the last 400 years and the development of kind of our technological world that we live in today was sparked by by that right abandoning an effectively you know a non-secular view of the natural world and and kind of saying okay this can be understood, and if it can be understood, it can be utilized. We can create our own uh, variants of this. Absolutely, we would be a very, very different species without astronomy. Um, this, I think, extends beyond just astronomy, right? There, there are questions uh, like, why do we need to spend money on X, mm -hmm. right? Where X can be anything like paleontology, like, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the mating patterns of uh, penguins. Yeah, that's like yeah, essential. That's right. <laughs> um, I think you know there's a tremendous uh, underappreciation for the usefulness of useless knowledge, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's brilliant. This is, I didn't yeah. come up with this. This was this is a little book by uh, the guy who started the Institute for Advanced Studies, mm -hmm. but um, you know it's it's so true so much of the electronics that are on this table, right, work on Maxwell's equations. Maxwell weren't, wasn't sitting around in the 1800s saying, you know, I hope one day, you know, uh, we'll make, you know, a couple mics so, you know, a couple, uh, you know, <laughs> a couple guys can, you know, have Talk this conversation, other. right? Yeah. That, that was at no, at no point was that the motivation. And yet, you know, it gave us, the world that we have today, and the answer is, if you are a purely pragmatic person, if you don't care at all about kind of the human condition, none of this, the answer is uh, you can tax it, right? Like useless things yeah. have, been, have cr created way more capital than useful things. And the sad thing, I mean, first of all, it's really important to think about and it's brilliant. In the in the following context, and like Neil deGrasse Tyson has this book about the role of military-based funding in the development of science, hmm. and then so much of uh, technological breakthroughs in the 20th century had to do with humans working on different military things, mm -hmm. and then the outcome of that had nothing to do with military. It had some military application, but. The, their impact was much, much bigger than military. Right. The splitting of the atom is is a kind of a canonical example of this. We all know the tragedy that 
you know, arises from splitting of the atom. And, and yet, you know, so much, I mean, <laughs> the atom itself does not care for what purpose it is being split. So, so I wonder if it, yeah. if we you take took the same amount of funding as we used for war and poured it into like totally seemingly useless things like the mating patterns of penguins, mm -hmm. we would get the internet anyway. I I think so. I think so. And uh, you know, perhaps more of the internet yeah. would have uh, would have penguins. You know, <laughs> well, wanted. so we're both joking, but in some sense, like. I wonder, it's not the, the penguins, because penguins is more about sort of biology, but all useless kind of tinkering and all kinds of, uh, right. in, in all kinds of avenues. And also because military applications are often um, burdened by the secrecy required. So it's often like so much, uh, the, the openness is lacking. And uh, if we learned anything for the last few decades is that when there's openness in science, that accelerates the development of science. That's right. That's true. The openness of science truly, you know, it benefits everybody. The notion that if, you know, I share my science with you, then you're going to catch up and like know the same right. thing. That is a short sighted viewpoint because if you catch up and you open, you know, you, you discover something that puts me in a position to do the next step, mm -hmm. right? It's just, so I absolutely agree with, um, with all of this. I mean, uh, the kind of question of like military funding versus non-military funding is, is obviously a complicated one, but at the end of the day, I think we have to get over the notion as a society that we are going to, you know, pay for this and then we will get that, mm -hmm. right? That's true if you're buying like, I don't know, toilet paper or something, right? It's just not true in the intellectual pursuit. That's not how it works. And sometimes it'll fail, right? Like sometimes like a huge fraction of what I do, right? I come up with an idea, I think, oh, it's great. And then I work it out, it's totally not great, right? Yeah. It fails immediately. Failure is not a sign that the initial pursuit was worthless. Right. So failure is just part of this kind of this whole exploration thing and we should fund more and more of this exploration, the variety of the That's exploration. Right. I think well, it was Linus Pauling or, or somebody from, you know, that generation of scientists said, uh, you know, a good way to have good ideas is to have a lot of ideas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's, I think that's true. Um, if you are conservative in your thinking, if you worry about proposing something that's going to fail and oh, what if, you know, like I, there's no science police that's gonna come and arrest you for proposing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's also just like, why would you, why would you do science if you're afraid of, you know, taking that step? It would be so much better to propose things that are that are plausible, that are interesting, and then for a fraction of them to be wrong, than to just kind of, you know, make incremental progress all your life, right? Speaking of wild ideas, let me ask you about the thing we mentioned previously, which is this interstellar object, Oumuamua. Uh -huh. Could it be space junk from a distant alien civilization? You can't immediately discount that by saying, absolutely, it cannot. Anything can be space junk. I mean, from that point of view, can any of the Kuiper Belt objects we see could you know, yeah. be space, space junk. Anything on the night sky can in principle be space junk. And Kuiper Belt would catch interstellar objects potentially and like force them into an orbit if they're like small enough? Uh, not the Kuiper Belt itself, but you can imagine like Jupiter family comets being gotcha. captured, uh, you know. So, so you can actually capture things. It's even easier to do this very early in the solar system, like early in the solar system's life while it's still in a cluster of stars. Um, it's unavoidable that you capture debris, whether it be natural debris or unnatural debris or just debris of some kind from other stars. That it's like a daycare center, right? Like everybody <laughs> passes their infections on to other kids. Yeah. Um, you know, or more and more, there's been a lot of discussion about and there's been a lot of interest in this over like is it is it aliens or is it not? But let's like if you just kind of look at the facts. Like what we know about it is it's kind of like a weird shape, 
and it also accelerated you yeah know, right like that's the two those are yeah. those are the two interesting uh things about it there are um there are puzzles about it and perhaps the most uh daring resolution to this puzzle is that it's not you know aliens or it's not like a rock it's actually a piece of hydrogen ice Mm. Right, so this is a friend of mine, uh, you know, Daryl Seligman, and Greg Laughlin came up with this uh, idea where that in giant molecular clouds that are just clouds of hydrogen, helium, gas that live in um, <clears throat> live throughout the galaxy at their cores, you can condense ice to become these hydrogen, you know, icebergs, if you will, and then. Uh, that explains many of the aspects of, uh, in fact, I think that explains all of the Oumuamua mystery, how it becomes elongated, mm -hmm. because basically the hydrogen ice sublimates and kind of like a bar of soap that, you know, slowly kind of elongates as you, uh, as you strip away the, uh, the surface layers, uh, how it was able to accelerate because of a jet that is produced from, you know, the hydrogen coming off of it, but you can't see it because it's hydrogen gas. Like all of this stuff uh, kind of falls together nicely. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm intrigued by that idea, truly, because it's like, if that's true, that's a new type of astrophysical object. And it would be produced by... Uh, what's the monster that produced it initially? That kind of object. It, uh, so this is giant molecular molecular clouds. They are everywhere. I mean, they are. The fact that they exist is not. Are they rogue clouds or are they part of like an Oort cloud? No, no, they're rogue solar? clouds. Yeah, they're, they're just, just floating about. Yeah. So if you go, like a lot of people imagine the galaxy as being a, you know, a bunch of stars, right? And they're just orbiting. Right, but the truth is, if you fly between stars, you you run into clouds. Uh, they that don't are, have any large object that creates orbits. So they're just floating about. Just floating. But why yeah. are they floating together? Oh, they just float together for a time and not. Well, so it's, it's, these are the these eventually become the nurseries of stars. So <laughs> as they as they cool, they contract and uh, you know then collapse into stars or into wow. groups of stars. But some of them, the the starless. Um, molecular clouds, according to the calculations that Daryl and Greg did, can uh, can create these like icicles of yeah. hydrogen ice. I wonder why they would be cool. flying so fast. Because oh. they seem to be moving pretty fast at a you quick pace. A more and more, yeah. Oh, uh, that's just because of their acceleration due to, uh, due to the sun. If you stop, I mean, it's like, take yeah. something really far away, let it go, and the sun is here. By the time it comes it's close to the to sun, fast. right, it's good, moving pretty fast. So that's an attractive explanation, I think, not so much because uh, it's cool, but it makes a clear prediction, mm -hmm. right, of when Vera Rubin Observatory comes online next year or so, we will discover many, many more of these objects, mm. right? And they have, um, so I like I like theories that are falsifiable, right? not ju not just testable but falsifiable. It's it's good to have a falsifiable theory where you can say that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, aliens is a, is one that's fundamentally difficult to say no. That's not aliens. Well, right? the interesting thing to me, if you look at one alien civilization, mm -hmm. and then we look at the things it produces in terms of if we were to try to detect the alien civilization, the there's like, uh, say there's 10 billion aliens, there would probably be mm, trillions of dumb drone type things produced by the aliens. And then be many, many, many more orders of magnitude of junk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, if you were to look for an alien civilization, in my mind, you would be looking for the junk. That's the more efficient thing to look for. The, so I'm not saying more and more has any characteristics of space junk, but it kind of opened my eyes like to the idea that we shouldn't necessarily be looking to the queen of the ant colony. We should be looking at, I don't know, I don't know, like like traces yeah. of alien life that doesn't look intelligent in any way, may not even look like life. It could be just garbage. We should be looking for garbage. 
just generically. <laughs> just generic. Well, garbage that's producible by yeah. uh, unnatural uh, forces. That, I mean, yeah. uh, for me at least, that was kind of interesting because if you have a successful alien civilization, that we would be producing many more orders of magnitude of junk, and that would be easier potentially to detect. Well, so uh, you have to produce the junk, but you have to also launch launch it. So this is the this is where. I mean, let's let's garbage imagine disposal. Yeah, <laughs> but let's imagine we are a successful civilization mm -hmm. that you know has made it to space. We clearly have, right? Um, and yes, we're in the infancy of that pursuit, but you know we've launched I don't know how many satellites. Um, probably, if you count GPS satellites, it must be at least thousands. It's, right? it's certainly thousands. I don't know if it's over 10,000, yeah. but it's on that order. But it's on that, like a large order of magnitude. How many of the things that we've launched will ever leave the solar system? I think two. It's two so far, Well, yeah. maybe the Voyager, the Voyager 1, Voyager 2. I don't know if the Pioneer. So maybe three, like. Oh, there's also a Tesla Roadster out there. Uh, that, that one, it will never leave the solar system. It'll just, uh, I think that one will, eventually collide with Mars. That can yeah. be SpaceX's first Mars you know, destination. <laughs> um, but look, so there is an energetic cost to interstellar travel, uh, which is really hard to overcome. And when, when we think about, you know, generically, what do we look for in an alien civilization? Oftentimes we tend to imagine that the thing you look for is the thing that we're doing right now. Yeah. Right. So I think that, um, you know, if I, if I look at the future, right? I and mean, for a while, like, it was like, okay, if aliens are are out there, they must be broadcasting in radio, right? right? That radio, um, you know, the amount that we broadcast in radio has diminished tremendously mm -hmm. in the last 50 years, but we're doing a lot more computation, right? What are the signs of computation? Like, that's a good, that's an interesting question to ask, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're, I don't know, I think, something on the order of a few percent of the entire electrical grid last year went to mining Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, well, we there, the, and the, yeah, the, the, there could be a lot of, in the future, different consequences of the computation, which, I mean, by, yeah. I'm biased, but it could be robotics, it could be artificial intelligence. So we may be looking for intelligent looking objects, like that's what I meant mm -hmm. by probes, like things that yeah. move in kind of artificial ways. But the emergence of, of AI is not an if, right? It's it's happening at, right in front of our eyes and the energetic costs associated with that are becoming, you know, a tangible problem. So I think, you know, if you imagine kind of extrapolating that into the future, right, what are the, you know, what becomes the bottleneck, right? The bottleneck might be powering, you know, powering the AI, broadly speaking, not one AI, but powering that entire AI ecosystem, right? So I don't know. I think, you know, space junk is, an, is kind of, uh, it's an interesting idea, but it's, it's heavily influenced by like sci-fi of 1950s, where yeah. by 2020, we're all like flying to the moon. Um, and so we produce a lot of space junk. I'm not sure if that's the pathway that alien civilizations take. Yeah, I've also it, never seen an alien civilization. I that's just don't that's know true. Anything. But if your uh, theory of chill <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, turns out to be true, and then we don't, you know, yeah. we don't necessarily explore. We seize the exploration phase of a, a like alien civilizations quickly seize the exploration phase of their. Um, of their efforts, then uh, then perhaps they'll just be chilling in a particular space, expanding slowly, but then using up a lot of resources and then have to have a lot of garbage disposal that sends stuff out. Yeah. And, and the other, you know, the other idea was that it could be a relay that uh, you'll almost have like these GPS like markers that you send throughout, which I think is kind of interesting. It's uh, similar to this probe idea of sending um, a large number of probes out to yeah. measure gravitational, um, to, to to measure basically, yeah, the, the the gravitational field essentially. I mean, a lot of people at Caltech or in, in MIT are trying to measure gravitational fields, and there's there's a lot of ideas of sending uh, um, 
stuff out there that accurately measures those gravitational fields uh, to have a greater understanding of the early universe. But then you might realize that communication through gravitation, through gravity is actually much more effective than, than radio waves, for example, something like that. And then you send out, I mean, okay. Yeah. If you're an alien civilization that's able to have gigantic masses, like mm -hmm. basically, we're getting there as a as a civilization. No, we're not not even close. Well, I mean, anyway. no, okay, <laughs> yeah. you're okay. I, you're, I I mean, like, be able to sort of uh, play with black holes, that kind of thing. So we're talking about yeah, a yeah. whole another different order of magnitude and masses. Then it, it may be very effective to send signals via gravitational waves. I actually, my sense is that all of these things are genuinely difficult to predict. You know, and I don't mean like. To, to kind of shy away. I just, I really mean if you think, if you take um, imagination of what the future looked like from, you know, 500 years ago, yeah. right? It's just, it is so hard to conceive of the impossible, right? So um, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, it's almost limiting to try and imagine things that are an order of magnitude, uh, you know, or two orders of magnitude ahead in terms of progress. Just because, you know, you mentioned cars before, you know, yeah. if you were to ask people what they wanted in 1870, it's faster buggies, <laughs> right? So, um, so I, I think the whole like kind of, you know, alien conversation inevitably gets gets limited by by our entire kind of collective um, astrophysical lack of imagination. Right. If you know, I so to to push back a little bit, I I find that it's really interesting to talk about these wild ideas about the future, whether it's mm -hmm. aliens, whether it's AI, with brilliant people like yourself who are focused on very particular tools of science we have today to solve very particular, like rigorous scientific questions. And it's almost like putting on this wild dreamy hat, like some percent of the time and say like, what are, mm -hmm. like, what would alien civilizations look like? What would alien trash look like? Well, what would our own civilization that sends out trillions of AI systems out there, like how 9,000, but 10,000 out there, what would that look like? And you're right, any one prediction is probably going to be horrendously wrong, but there's something about creating these kind of wild predictions I know, I know, that kind of opens up. Uh, no, there's a huge magnetism to it, right? And some of, some of it, um, you know, I mean, some of the Jules Verne novels did a phenomenal job predicting the future right <laughs> uh that that actually was a great example of what you're talking about right allowing your imagination to run free i mean i just hope i just hope there there's dragons that's there's like dragons yeah, that's, i love dragons yeah dragons are the best um, <laughs> uh but see the cool thing about sci science fiction and these kinds of mm -hmm. conversations it doesn't just predict the future i think some of these things will create the future. Pl planting the idea. This is how the humans are amazing. Like fake it till you make it. <laughs> it, it humans are really good at uh, taking an idea that seems impossible at the time. And for one, any one individual human, that idea is like a, it's like planting a seed yes. that eventually it's materializes true. itself. Yeah. It's weird. It's weird yeah, how yeah, like yeah. science fiction can, create science and drive some of it the, drives the yeah, science i agree with you and uh and i think in this regard you know i i'm like a sucker for for sci-fi <laughs> um it's it's all i listen to like now when i when i run and um and some of it is completely implausible right and it's just like i don't care it's it's, it's so it's um uh, it's both entertaining and uh you know it's just like it's imagination. You know about the Black Clouds book? Uh, I think this is by Fred Hoyle. This is like, this has great connections with sort of a lot of the advancements that are happening in NLP uh, right now, mm -hmm. right? With, you know, transformer models and so on. But, uh, you know, it's this black cloud shows up in, in the solar system. And then, you know, people try to send radio and then it learns to talk back at you, wow. you know? So anyway, we don't, 
have to talk at all about it, but it's just it's something worth checking out. With that, that on the alien front, with the, like a black cloud, to me, on the, exactly on the NLP front, and also just explainability of AI, it's fascinating. Just the very question, Stephen Wolfram looked at this with the movie Arrival. It's like, what would be the common language that we would discover? The, the reason that's really interesting to me is we have yeah. aliens Jap here on Earth Japanese. now. Japanese. Japanese, well, yeah. yeah. Japanese is the obvious answer. <laughs> Japanese, yeah, that yeah. would be the common, uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe it would be music actually. Uh, that's more likely, it wouldn't be a language, it would be art that they would communicate. But, you know, yeah. I, I do believe that we have, I'm with uh, Stephen Wolfram on this a little bit, that to me, computation, like programs we write, that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that they're kind of intelligent creatures. And I feel like we haven't found the common language to talk with them. Like our little creations that are artificial are not born with the, whatever that innate thing that produces language with us. And like coming up with mechanisms for communicating with them uh, is, uh, is an effort that feels like it will produce some incredible discoveries. You can even think of, mm -hmm. if you think that math is discovered, mathematics in itself is a kind of, um, Oh yeah, it's an innate construction of, of the world we live in. Um, I think we are, you know, part of the way there because pre-1950, right, the computers were, were human beings that would carry out arithmetic, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it was Ulam um, who worked in Los Alamos at, at, the, uh, at the time, like towards the end of the Second World War, uh, wrote something about how, you know, in the future, right, computers will not be just arithmetic tool, but will be truly an interactive, you know, thing with which you could do experiments, right? At the mm -hmm. time, the notion of doing an experiment, not like in the lab with some beakers, but you know, an experiment on a computer, designing an experiment, on a numerical experiment, mm -hmm. was a new one. That's like, you know, 70% of what I do is I design, com you know, I write code, terrible code to be uh, clear, like, but, you know, I write code that creates an experiment, which is a, which is a simulation. So in that sense, I think we're beginning to interact with the computer in, in a way that you're saying, not as just a, you know, fancy calculator, not as just a, you know, call and request uh, type of, Thing, but but you know something that can generate uh, generate insights that are otherwise completely unattainable, mm -hmm. right? They're unattainable by doing analytical mathematics. Yeah, and there's uh, like with the AlphaFold two, we're now trying to we're now starting to crack open biology, so being able to si simulate at first trivial biological systems mm -hmm. and hopefully down the line complex biological systems. Right. My hope is to be able to simulate. Psycholo psychological, like sociological systems, like humans. I've, you know, um, a large part of my work at, at MIT was on, on autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. And the fascinating thing to me was about ped uh, pedestrians, human pedestrians interacting with autonomous vehicles and simulating those systems without murdering humans mm -hmm. would be very useful, but it nevertheless is exceptionally so. difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. When is my Mustang gonna drive itself? <laughs> right, it's, you know, I'm not even joking, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. I, it turns out it's much difficult, it's much more difficult than we imagined. Yeah. And, and I, I suppose that's the kind of, the um, progress of science is uh, just like, you know, going to Mars, it's probably going to turn out to be way more difficult than we imagine. Sending out probes to investigate planet nine at the edge of our solar system might turn out to be way more difficult than we imagine, but we do it anyway. Yeah. And we figure it out in the end. It's actually Mars is a great, I mean, going, sending humans to Mars, is way more complicated than human, sending humans to the moon. You'd think just like naively, yeah. both are in space, who cares? Like, well, if you go there, why don't you go there? Um, you know, this life support is a, is an extremely expensive thing, yeah. There's a bunch of extra challenges, but I disagree with you. I would be one of the early people to go. I used to think not. Yeah. I used to think I'd be one of the first maybe million to go once you have a little bit of a society. I think I'm, I'm upgrading myself to the first like 10,000. Yeah, that's right, front of the, front of the cabin. Yeah. Not completely front, but like, <laughs> 
it would be yeah. interesting to die. I'm I'm okay with uh, death. Sucks, but I kind of like the idea of dying on Mars. Of all the places to die, I gotta say, in this regard, like I don't want to die on Mars. I, you don't? No, no. I would much rather die on Earth. Uh, I mean, death is is fundamentally boring, right? Like, death is a very boring experience. I, I mean, I've never died before, so I don't know from firsthand experience. As, as far as you know, yeah, right? it could be a reincarnation, <laughs> all those kinds of things. So, you, you mean, uh, where where would you die uh, if you had to choose? Oh man. Um, okay, so and you know, I would definitely, you know, there's a question of who I'd want to die with. Mm. You know, I'd prefer not to die alone. Uh, but like you know, surrounded by family would be uh, would be preferable. Where I think northern New Mexico, and I'm not even joking. Like this is not a random. Place. It's just like would that be your favorite place on Earth? Not necessarily. Like favorite place on Earth to to <laughs> to, to <laughs> reside at. You know, indefinitely. But it is it is one of the most beautiful places I've wow. I've ever been to. Uh, so. You know, there's something, I don't know, there's something attractive about about going, you know. Returning to nature in a beautiful right. uh, place. Let me ask you about another aspect of your life that is full of beauty, music. Okay. You're a musician. Uh, the absurd question I have to ask, what is the greatest song of all time? Oh. Objectively speaking. The greatest song of all time. I, I suppose yeah. that could change moment to moment, day to day. But if you were forced to answer for this particular moment in your life, that's something that pops to mind. This could be both philosophically, this could be technically as a musician, like what you enjoy, maybe lyrics. Like for me, mm -hmm. it's lyrics mm -hmm. is very important. So Absolutely. I would probably, it would be, uh, my choice would be lyrics based. I don't want to answer in terms of just technical, uh, you know, technical prowess. I think technical prowess is impressive, right? It's just like, it's impressive what yeah. can be done. I wouldn't place that into the category of the greatest music ever written. Some of the classical music uh, that's, that's written is undeniably beautiful, but I don't want to consider that category of music either, uh, just because, you know, so if I, if I was to limit uh, the scope of this philosophical discussion uh, to, you know, the kind of music that I listen to, you know, probably What's My Age Again by Blink-182. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a solid one. It's got, you know. <laughs> Said nobody ever. That's a good yeah, song. Yeah. <laughs> I don't no, even no, know no. if you're joking. No, but no, I, I, am, I am joking. It's a good one, but it's, it was, yeah, I mean. I, I, I'm back is a close second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's my age again yeah oh yeah no i mean it would probably you know songwriting wise i think the beatles came pretty close to Were they influential to you i was like the beatles yeah love the beatles i love the beatles uh let it be I, yesterday yeah like straw i think strawberry fields forever strawberry is fields. is one of, you know what, what one of my favorite beatles songs is it's uh you know in my life, right? That's not, it's it's hard oh, to imagine yeah. how whatever a twenty four year old yeah. wrote that. It's, it is one of the most uh, introspective pieces of music ever. You know, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, and so I think you know if you were to you can sort of look at the entire Dark Side of the Moon album and as you know getting pretty close up there to the pinnacle of what you know can be created. So. You know, time is a great song. Yeah, time's a great song. The, yeah. The, just the entirety of just the instruments, the lyrics, the the the, the mm -hmm. feeling created by a song, like Pink Floyd, can create feelings. Just the the entire experience. I mean, you have that with the Wall of just uh, transporting you into another place. Songs yeah. don't. Not many songs could do that as as, as, as well. Uh, not many artists can do that as well as Pink Floyd did. There are a lot of bands that you can kind of say, oh yeah, like if you take Blink-182, right? If you have no idea, like if you are listening to sort of that type of pop punk for the first time, it's difficult to differentiate between Blink-182 and like Sum 41 and the thousand of other like lesser known 
mm-hmm. bands that all sounded they all, they all had that sparkling production uh feel they all kind of sounded the same yeah. uh right when it with pink floyd it's hard to find another band that you're like well is this one pink floyd or like you know yeah when you're listening that's to Pink Floyd, when you, what you're listening to. The, the uniqueness, that, yeah. that's fascinating. You know, in the calculation of the greatest song and the greatest band of all time, you could probably, you could probably actually quantify this, like scientifically, mm-hmm. is like how unique, uh, if you play a different songs, how well are people able to recognize whether it's this band or not? And that, you know, that's a, probably a huge component to greatness. Like if the world would miss it, if it was gone, Yes, yes. So, but, but yeah. there's also the human story things. Like I would say, I would put Johnny Cash's cover of "Hurt" mm-hmm. as one of the greatest songs of all time, and that has less to do with the song, but your interaction with it, w- interaction really? with it, but also the human, the full story of the human. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's not just if I just heard the song, it'd be like, okay, that. Yeah. But if it, it's the full story of it, also the video component for that particular song. So like that, you can't discount the full experience of it. Absolutely, you know, I have no confusion about not you know, about being, you know, anywhere, uh, you know, in in that lane. But I just like I sometimes think about you know music that is being uh, produced today feels oftentimes feels like like kind of clothes, like clothes that you buy at like H and M and you wear three times before they rip and you throw away. So like so much of it is, it's not bad. It's just kind of forgettable, right? Like the the fact that we're talking about Pink Floyd in 2021 yeah. is in itself an interesting uh, question. Why are we talking about Pink Floyd? And it's, there's something unforgettable about them and uh, unforgettable about the, the art that they created. That could be the markets yeah. that like, so Spotify has created this kind of market where the the incentives for creating music that lasts is much lower because there's so much more music. Right. You just want something that shines bright for a short amount of time, makes a lot of money and moves on. And the, I mean, the same thing you see with the news and all those kinds right. of things. We're just living yeah. in a shorter and shorter, shorter like uh, time scale in terms of our attention spans. And that um, nevertheless, when we look at the long arc of history of music, perhaps there will be some songs from today that will last as much as Pink Floyd. We're just unable to see it. Yeah, just the uh, collected works of Nickelback. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you never know. You yeah, never know. Justin right. Bieber, the, it could have. Oh, yeah, yeah. It could be a contender. I've recently started listening to Justin Bieber just to understand what people are talking about. And you know, I'll just keep my comments to myself on that one. It's too good to it's explain good. in the in words, words. Cannot yeah, yeah. capture <laughs> the greatness yeah. that is the Biebs. Uh You as a musician. Mm-hmm. So you uh, you write your own music, you uh, play guitar, you sing. Um, maybe can you give an overview of the role music has played in your life? You're one of the you're a world class scientist, and so it's kind of fascinating to see somebody um, in your position who is also a great musician and 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 uh, still loves playing music. Yeah, well, I wouldn't call myself a great musician. I yeah. like, you know, one of the best of all time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, like we were saying offline, confidence is like the most essential thing about that's being right. a rock star. Exactly. You, you, uh, it's the confidence and kind of like moodiness, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I mean, music plays an absolutely essential role in in everything I do because I lose if I stop playing for one reason or another, say I'm traveling, I notably lose creativity in every other aspect of my life, right? There's something, I don't view, you know, playing music as a separate endeavor from doing science or doing doing whatever. It's all, it's all part of that same creative thing, which is distinct from, I don't know, uh, pressing a button or like, you know. So it's not a break from science. It's yeah. a part of your science. It's absolutely is a, is a part of, it. it's, it's, I would say, you know, it's a thing that enables the science, right? The science would 
you know, suck even more than it does already uh, without the music. And that means like the creating of the, the writing of the music or is it just even playing other people's stuff? Is it, is it the it's whole both. of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely both. Um, yeah, and also just, you know, I love, uh, love to play guitar, love to sing, you know, my wife tolerates my, uh, my screeching singing, you know, and uh, <laughs> even kind of likes it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so people should check out your stuff. You have a great voice, so I, I love I love your stuff. Um, is there something you're you're super busy? Uh, is there something you can say about practicing uh, for musicians for guitar? For you're also in a band, so like that yeah. whole how you can manage that. Is there some tricks? Is there some hacks to? Um, being a lifelong musician while being like super yeah. busy? So I would say, you know, the way that I optimize um, my life is I try to, I try to do, you know, the thing that I'm passionate about in a moment um, and put that at the top of the priority list. Mm -hmm. There are moments when, you know, you just, you feel inspired to play music. And if you're in the middle of something, if you can avoid, if that can be put on hold, just do it, right? There are times when you get inspired about something scientific, um, you know, I do my best to drop everything, go into that, you know, mode of, or that isolated mode and, and execute upon that. So it's a chaotic, you know, I, I think I have a pretty chaotic lifestyle where I'm always doing kind of multiple things and jumping bef between uh, between what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, it's it's not like um, you know those those moments of inspiration are actually kind of rare, right? Like mm -hmm. most of the time, all of us are just doing kind of uh, doing the stuff that get that needs to get done. If you do the disservice to yourself of saying, oh, I'm inspired to, you know, do this calculation, figure figure this out, but I've got to answer email <laughs> or right. just like do something, something silly, uh, you know, that is a, um, that is nothing more than disservice. And also like I have some social media presence, but I, I mostly stay off of, you know, social media to, you know, just frankly, because like I don't kind of I don't enjoy the mental cycles that it uh, that yeah, it, takes it, it robs you of that uh, the yeah yeah the, those those precious moments mm -hmm. that could be filled with inspiration in your in your other pursuits. Um, but th there's something to maybe you and I are different in this. Like I I try to play at least ten uh, minutes of guitar every day, mm -hmm. oh, oh, like almost on the technical side, yeah. like keeping that base uh, of of basic competence going. Yeah. And I mean, the same way like writers will get in front of a paper, no matter what, that kind of thing. It just feels like that for my life has been essential to, 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 to d the daily ritual yeah. of it. Otherwise days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months and you haven't played guitar for months. No, no, I, I, I understand for me, I think it's it's been like if we have a gig coming up, we'll definitely <laughs> you need deadlines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. No, like we we will uh, we will sharpen up uh, definitely. You know, especially co coming up to a gig. It's like you know we're not trying to make money with this. This is like just for the uh, for for that satisfaction of doing something, doing something well, mm -hmm. right? Um, but overall. I would say most, I, I play guitar most days, right? most days. And, you know, when I put kids to sleep, uh, I, I play guitar, you know, with them and we like just make up random songs about, <laughs> you know, uh, about our cat or something, yeah. you know, like we just do kind of random stuff. Uh, but, you know, music is always involved in that process. Yeah, uh, keeping yeah. it fun. You have Russian roots? I sure do. Were you born in Russia? I was. Yeah. When did you come here? So uh, I came to the U.S. in very the very end of '99, but um, so I was like almost 14 years old. But along the way, uh, we spent six years in Japan. So like we moved from Russia to Japan in '94, and then to the U.S. in '99. So I did like elementary school. Oh, interesting. School in Japan. So so. 
elementary school in Japan. Yeah. So that's interesting. Do you still speak Russian? Sure. Okay. Ты по-русски говоришь? Да, конечно. Okay, maybe I'll uh let me ask you in, in Russian um что ты помнишь о России? I'd be interesting to hear you speak a little bit. Да, ну, в общем, в целом я помню, то есть мне было 8, когда мы э uh, уехали. И конечно, как сказать, помню в первом приближении все, включая вот переход там 91-92 год, вот это вот вот этот турбулентный период, еще, естественно, 93-й. То есть еще я очень хорошо помню, как а, в какой-то момент а, сначала появилась Пепси-кола, а потом появилась Кока-кола. Я подумал, я, я помню, я был лет, не знаю, в 6, и я подумал, как так может быть, что Кока-кола украла продукт и сделала то же самое. То есть я никогда... Я, я долго думал, что и Пепси, и Кока-Колу изобрели типа в 92-м году. <laughs> so, uh, for people who don't speak Russian, Konstantin was uh, talking about basically his first in 1992 interaction with capitalism, <laughs> which is Pepsi, and uh, at first he discovered Pepsi, and then he discovered Coke, and he was confused how such uh, how, how such theft could occur. Yeah, like an intellectual property theft. And remember, <laughs> Pepsi arrived to the Soviet Union first. And there was some, there's some complicated story which I don't uh, quite understand the details of. For a while, Pepsi like commanded submarines or something. There, there, yeah, Pepsi had like a fleet of Soviet submarines that it was. <laughs> they were sponsoring <laughs> <laughs> tanks and uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. And, I, and I remember there's certain things that trickled in like McDonald's, I remember that was yeah. a big deal. Oh there's yeah, certain I remember. Of the West. Absolutely. So I mean, we went to McDonald's, and we stood on. I mean, this is this is absurd, right? From kind of looking at it from today's yeah. perspective, but we stood in line for like six hours to get into this McDonald's, and you know, I remember inside it was just like a billion people, and I'm just taking a bite out of that, out of that Big Mac. We're I mean, like, wow. What was it? An incredible experience for you. So like, the, what was, is this taste of the West like? Uh, you <laughs> Did know, you enjoy it? I enjoyed the fact that, I mean, this is like, this is getting into the weeds, but I, I really enjoyed the fact that the top of the bun had those seeds, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. the, and I remember how on, on the commercials, like the Big Mac would kind of bounce. Mm -hmm. I was like, the seeds, how do they inject the seeds into the yeah. bread? Like, amazing, yeah. right? So I think it was- uh, it was Artistry. More, Yeah, the, it was the, you enjoy the, the artistry exactly, of the culinary it the, experience. Exactly, it was the, you know, it was the <laughs> yeah, food art that, kind of that is the Big Mac. Actually, I still don't know the answer to that. How do they get the sesame seeds on It's the It's better bun? to not know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you just wander the mystery of it all. Yeah, I remember it being exceptionally delicious, but I, I'm with you. I don't know, you didn't mention how transformative Pepsi was, but to me, basically sugar-based stuff like, mm -hmm. like Pepsi, Yeah. was uh or a coke i don't remember which one we partook in but that was an incredible experience yeah 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 no absolutely and uh you know i think it's um you know it was an Im important and and formative uh formative period i sometimes i guess rely on that a little bit uh you know in my daily life because uh i remember like the the early 90s were real rough you know like my parents were kind of on the on the bottom of the, the spectrum in terms of uh you know in terms of financial well-being so um kind of like just when i run into trouble not like you know money trouble just any kind of trouble these days it it just kind of is not Uh, particularly meaningful when you compare it to that that turbulent time of the the early 90s. And the other thing is, I think there's there's like an advantage to to being you know an immigrant, which is that you get you go through the mental exercise of changing your environment completely early in your life. Right? You go. It's by no means you know pleasant uh, in the moment, right? But like going into Japanese elementary school, right? Like I didn't go to a some like private, you know, 
thing. I just went to a regular like Japanese public elementary school and I was the non-Japanese person mm -hmm. in my class. So just like the learning Japanese and just kind of. So go. that's a super humbling experience in many ways. Was when you like made fun of all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah being the that, outsider. Oh, absolutely. But you know, you kind of do, you kind of do that. And then you kind of, then you just kind of are okay with, with stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so yeah. like doing that again in middle school in the US, it was arguably easy because I was like, yeah, well, I've already done this before. So I think it kind of prepares you mentally a little bit for for switching up for whatever, you know, changes that will come up for the rest of, uh, of your life. So I, um, I wouldn't trade that that experience really for anything. It's a huge aspect of, of who I am, and I'm sure you can relate to a lot of this. Yes, uh, is there advice from your life that you can give to young people today, high school, college, you know, about their career, or maybe about life in general? I'm not like a career coach by- <laughs> Life account, coach. Right, like I'm definitely not a life coach. I don't have it all figured <laughs> out. But I think there's a, um, there's a perpetual cycle of, of um, you know, thinking that there is a, um, there's kind of like a template for success, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there is, but I, in my experience, I haven't seen it, right? Um, you know, I would say people in high school, right? Uh, so much of their focus is on getting straight A's, filling their CV with this and this and this so that it looks impressive, mm -hmm. right? Um, that That is not, I think, a good way to optimize your life, right? Do the thing that fills your life with passion, do the thing that fills your life with, with interest and, you know, do that perpetually, right? A straight A student, you know, is really impressive, but also, you know, somewhat boring, mm -hmm. right? So, so I, I think, you know, injection of more of that kind of um, interest into, into the lives of young people would go a long way in, in just both upping their level of happiness and then just kind of ensuring that looking forward, they are not suffering from a, Con, you know, perpetual condition of, oh, I have to satisfy these like, you know, check boxes to, to do well, right? Because you can lose yourself in that whole process for the rest of your life. But it's nice if it's possible, like Max Tegmark was exceptionally good at this uh, at MIT, mm -hmm. figure out how you can spend a small part of your percent of your efforts that such that your CV looks really impressive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's no, like, without a doubt, like that's a, that's a baseline that you need to have, um, you know <laughs> and then I mean? spend so like spend most of your time doing like amazing things you're passionate about, but such that it uh, uh, kind of like Planet Nine produces objects that uh, that feed your CV, <laughs> uh, like right. slowly over time. So getting good grades in high school, maybe doing extracurricular activities, or or in terms of like. You know, for programmers that's producing code that you can show up on GitHub, like leaving traces like um, throughout your efforts such that your CV looks impressive to the rest yeah. of the world. In fact, I mean, this is somewhat along the lines of what I'm talking about. See, like getting like good grades is important, but grades are not a tangible like product. Right. Like you cannot out, you know, show your A and, and have your A live a separate life from you. Code very much does, right? Um, music very much takes on, mm -hmm. you know, provided somebody else listens to it, right? <laughs> right? Provide, like, takes on a life of its own. That's kind of what I mean, right? Doing, doing stuff that, uh, that can then s get separated from, from you is, is exceptionally it's attractive, right? It's like a, it's like a fun, and uh, it's an, and it's also very impressive to others. I think we're moving to a world where grades mean less and less, like certifications mean less and less. Yeah. If you look at, especially again in the computing fields, getting a degree, finishing your, um, uh, currently just getting finishing your degree, whether it's bachelor's or master's mm -hmm. or PhD, is less important than the things you've actually put out into the world. 
Right, right. And that's a fascinating kind of, that's, a, that's great that in that sense, the meritocracy is, is in its richest, most beautiful form is, is starting to win out. Yeah, it's weird. Cause like, uh, you know, my understanding, and I'm not like, I don't know the history of science well enough to, to speak very confidently about this, but you know, the advisor of my advisor of my advisor from undergrad, um, like didn't have a PhD. Right. So I think it was a more common thing back mm -hmm. in the day, even in uh, the academic sector, to, you know, not have, you know, Faraday, like Far Faraday didn't know algebra, mm -hmm. right? And drew diagrams about, you know, magnetic fields. And like his, Faraday's law was derived entirely from intuition. So uh, it is interesting to, to how the world of academia has evolved into a, you got to do this and then get PhD, then you have to postdoc once and twice and maybe thrice, and then like you you move on. So, you know, it does, I do wonder, you know, if we're, you know, if there's a better I think better we're heading approach, there, but know, it's a fascinating to, historical yeah. perspective, like that we might've just tried this whole thing out uh, for a while where we put a lot more emphasis on grades and certificates and um, degrees yeah. and all those kinds of things. I think the difference historically is like we can actually using the internet show off the show off ourselves and our creations mm. better and better and more effectively, whether so that's can, code or producing videos or all those kinds of things. That's right. You can become a certified drone pilot. It's true. <laughs> of, of all the th of all yeah. the things you want to pick, yeah, for sure. <laughs> or you could just fly and make YouTube videos that gets hundreds of thousands of views with your drone and with never getting a certificate. Um, <laughs> that's probably illegal. Don't do it. What do you think is uh, the meaning of this whole thing? So you, you look at planets; mm -hmm. they they seem to orbit stuff um, without without asking the why question. And for some reason, life emerged on Earth such that it led to big brains that can ask the big mm -hmm. why question. Do you think there's an answer to it? Um, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> like, what, what Meaning do you of life? The meaning of life. Um, it's 42. It's 42. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, it's, um, you know, why, I think the, if the question you're asking is like, why we do all this, right? Why we do yeah. all this. Um, it's part of the human condition, right? Human beings are fundamentally, I feel like non, uh, like sort of stochastic and fundamentally interested in, <laughs> in kind of expanding our own understanding of, of the world around us. And creating stuff yeah. to uh, enable that understanding. So we're like stochastic, fundamentally stochastic. So like there's a, just a bunch of randomness that really yeah. doesn't seem like it has a good explanation. And yet there's a, a kind of direction to our being that we just keep wanting to create and to understand. That's right. I've met people that are, you know, that claim to be anti-science, right? Um, and, Yet in their anti-science, you know, discussion, they're like, well, like, if you're so, you know, yeah. scientific, then how, why don't you explain to me how, I don't know, this works? Yeah, and like, yeah. it, it always, there's that fundamental there's curiosity. seed of curiosity <laughs> and interest yeah. that is common to, to all of us. Yeah. That is absolutely what makes us human, right? And... And I've, I'm in a privileged position of being able to, you know, to have that be my my job, yeah. right? I think as, uh, you know, as time evolves forward, you know, and the kind of economy changes, I mean, we're already starting to see, you know, a shift towards that type of, you know, creative, uh, you know, enterprise as being, as merging, as taking over a bigger and bigger chunk of the, sector. It's not yet, I think, the dominant uh, portion of the economy by any account. But if we compare this to like, you know, the time when the dominant thing you would do would be to, you know, go to a factory and, and do the same exact thing, right? I think, you know, there's a tide there and, and things are sort of headed in that direction. Yeah, life's becoming more and more fun. I can't wait. Uh, honestly, what <laughs> happens next? I can't wait next? to just chill. 
just know, just the, chill. The terminal point of this is you just <laughs> chill and wait for those Kuiper Belt objects to complete one orbit. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to credit you with this idea. Uh, I do hope that we definitively discover a proof that there is a Planet Nine out there in the next few years, so you can sit back with a cigar, or a cigarette, or vodka, or wine, and just uh, say, "I told you so." That's already happening. <laughs> I'm going to do that later tonight. <laughs> this, well, as I mentioned, uh, confidence is essential to being a rock star. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, explaining so many fascinating things to me today. I really appreciate the work that you do out there. And um, I really appreciate you talking with me today. Well, Thanks, Constantine. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Constantine Batigan. And thank you to Squarespace, Literati, Onnit, and and I. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Douglas Adams in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 92 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descendant life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time.